The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Adapted by Sebastian Bonchkevich Part 1 Who are we seeing to? 27. For here? Governor wants him buried tonight. The dead, they say, comprehend everything. The old and now in all his glory. <clears throat> the late, not so very great, Abbe Ferrea. <coughs> Stinks in here. Never noticed. But what of the man forced to live as though dead? Huh? Oh, mother of God, he's heavier than he looks at each one. Which way round do you want to do this? We're top of the head first. You hold the ends together and I'll stop stitching up the shroud here. What of the man, the living... Scarcely breathing, man. You ever think it's true? The treasure Abbe Faria said he had stashed. What of Edmond Dantes? What do you think? <coughs> Where's the weight? <coughs> You'd think you'd be stiffer in the limbs, wouldn't you? Bring the barrel over, please. Well, five hours is a long time. You get hold of the weight and I'll lift his feet in first. <sighs> and then. The body. You come here today, my most honoured friends, and ask me to describe all I know of the cataclysm in Paris. Oh, what's what you're doing? I'm sorry, Swan. And now that a fitting and respectful time has passed, so as not to dishonour the insane and the dead, it is the Count's most solemn wish that I, Ide, his loved and trusted companion, now describe in every detail the events of that extraordinary year in Paris. Get, get the body back in the barrow. So that you may understand at last the meaning of the Count's actions. I'm trying. And comprehend finally the true nature of his wrath and revelation. That's more like it. But first, most honored friends, you asked me to describe the situation of his birth. Now, let's get rid of it. His pedigree and parentage. But I must say to you clearly, and I hope without rancor, that the character of the Count is forged here, in the bowels of the notorious Chateau d'If, with neither pedigree nor parentage to guide or protect him, when he is still poor, wronged Edmond Dantes. Imagine, though. Just imagine if Faria was right. The treasure of Monte Cristo. Monte Cristo is nothing but a pissing stop off Corsica. Ugh. I'm getting right too old for this. Armed only with a righteous storm of vengeful fury, which rages now in his embattled and broken heart. Thunder now. Let's get this done, Swan. Ah, oh, Dantes. Dantes, when will your ordeal... Maybe, Claude, you'd be so kind as to open the door to the parapet. Be done. There's no need to be nasty. <laughs> Mary and Joseph, wheel the barrow over to the buttons and tip it on my say-so. But where are you going to be? I'm carrying you down. You're not expecting me to tip him without you? My back's gone. Then he can stay out here all night and you can explain that to the governor. Oh, just tip it when I say so. And now... One. At last... Two. He's... Three. Free. And it's here, in this one desperate moment, that the true beginnings of the Count may be properly perceived. It's here, in the depths of the unrepentant sea, pinch black and frozen, while Edmond Dantes, forgotten prisoner 34, struggles to discover the knife he has for so long concealed. A knife, he prays, will soar through the thoroughly secured bonds which hold him fast to the very bottom of the sea. Dantes, now tempted by the seduction of the deep, to relinquish, to surrender, to forget. Dantes, who knows that in actual fact he can never surrender. 
Dantes who knows in every aching fibre of his being that he must, in actual fact, now fulfil the destiny he has appointed for himself and at last be... reborn. Our time together is short. Am I dead? On the contrary, dear Dantes, it is I who has passed. But you can't be here, my dear old friend. You can't be. Always remember, Edmund. Never forget. Never forget what? The names of those that wronged you. Uh, the names of those who connived uh, to ensure your disgrace and destruction. Never forget them. Never. No. No. Then say them. Say them. I'm loud for all the universe to hear. I can't. I can't. I'm so tired. Yeah, I'm say so... them, Edmund. Uh, Dongla. Yes, Dongla. And? Fennel. And? Fennel, Fennel. The, the, yeah, the good, Catalan. don't as good. Uh, Remember. Uh, who else? Uh, uh, the, the prosecutor. The, the crown prosecutor. His name, don't as say his name. The will fall. Repeat them. Repeat the names of those who betrayed you. Dongla, Fenor, the Vilfor. Louder. Dongla, Fenor, the Vilfor. Louder still, Dantes. Loud enough to wake the righteous. Dongla, Fenor, the Vilfor. Good, Dantes. But what of you, my, my dear Abby? Good love, you're there for it, fool, you hear me? At about this time, I'd imagine. The prison guards are opening the door to your cell. I'm talking to you, Dantes. And we'll attempt to rouse you. Stop playing silly buggers, 34, and get... Oh, no. Oh, bloody hell, no. Close! Close, I'll affect the governor! What's happened, Swan? Dantes. Dantes has escaped. What do you mean, escaped? Look! That's the Abbey. Oh, no. Then where's Dante's? Exactly. It is all exactly as we predicted, Dante's. But now you must concentrate. Now you must remember why God has given you this great opportunity. Don't love de Villefort. Yes. Don't love the will fall, and I shall be avenged. Yes. But how? With God's blessing, Dantes. With the powers of deduction I taught you. And with the treasure. The treasure I bequeathed you. The treasure of Monte Cristo. Oh. Trust that you do God's will, dear Edmund. Trust that you are his chosen instrument of revenge and revelation. I do trust it. I do. And that from this moment on, no earthly king can ever command or contain you again. Rigor. And then, as if sent by the very hand of God, the bloated body of a drowned Maltese seaman thumps insolently onto the rocks beside him. Dantes, swift as wild lightning, casts off his filthy prison shirt and hastily pulls on the drowned man's cap and blue jerkin. Over here! Over here! On the rocks here! On the, on the rocks! I, I can't, I, I can't reach it, I can't reach it! Run! Oh, it's not good! You have to let go of the rock! Oh, don't be drowned! I'll haul you in if you can grab it! Now try! Help me! Help me! Swim! To what? The rock! I have it! I have it! Then hold fast! Then I... 
Gotcha, Maltese! Maltese? Think, Dante. Think. You are Maltese, aren't you? The wreck yonder. Thought you had to have been. I know. I am. I, I am. Maltese. Yeah, my, my ship was wrecked. Thank you. Thank you. Who is he, Jacopo? Poor man's half drained, Captain, but I think he's Maltese. Yeah, throw him overboard. Check that none of these kegs is damaged. Captain Batana. Good watch, you're not thinking straight, Jacopo. He's a spy or squeals to the Coast Guard. Then I'll cut it straight myself. Let's just give him a chance. That's all I ask. Oh, he's safe. Let's get out of the storm. Hey. Have some rum, Maltese. <laughs> That's it, my friend. That's it. Gently. Oh, gently. Thank you. Thank you. Don't want you dying on us, do we? No. What's your name? The name's Jacopo. Now, listen to me. Because I don't want to have to say this twice, all right? All right. You don't know us. You don't remember us, clear? Smugglers. You're, uh, you're smugglers. And best you forget it. Now, rest up as well as you're able, and we'll see where we are in the morning. Assuming we're all here, that is. Oh, but wait, friend. The year. What's the year? What? The year. Uh, 1829. And the date? Uh, February the 28th. Fourteen years. Fourteen years. You've got to rest, Mortis. <laughs> huh? Rest. <laughs> but sleep will not come for Dante's. Fourteen years. Fourteen. Yes. By dawn, the storm has passed, leaving the sea restless, rebellious. You'll never dare between the rocks, Captain! Think too wild! Let me try! We're way too close! Think I don't know that! Stir around! Pull her! I am pulling, but she won't! Can I give her a try! You need to get below, Moti! I know these waters! From where? Tell them a hundred times, and worse than this, too! Give your mate the wheel! Now, the trick is to sail her into the squall, and then... <clears throat> Surprise her! He's running away from the boat! Yeah. Do you see that, Captain <laughs> Good work, Maltese! Oh, where are we headed? South to Corsica. <sighs> you want me to take over? Oh, she's a good boat, this. She handles well. Of course she does. She's a Jeune Amelie. Hold her steady now. Understood? <laughs> nicely done, Maltese. <laughs> Very nicely done. <laughs> <laughs> Confident, suddenly youthful Edmond Dantes stands again at the prow of a ship. There she goes! And as the days become weeks, Dantes makes himself indispensable. Who taught you to sell this good Maltese? Picked it up. Picked it up? You're a master seaman. Ask no questions, Jacopo. But Tom won't hear a word against you. That's rare, Maltese. Rare like... Unicorns is rare. You're a good man, Jacopo. And I owe you my life. You did every man aboard a fever. Doesn't mean I'm not grateful, though. Nor will I forget it. Never. <laughs> You're a strange one, Maltese. But as Dante's confidently commands the wheel, there now rises before him a younger and more innocent incarnation of himself, standing at the prow of another great ship he came to think of as his own. The Phaeron. Observe her now, most honored friends, as she glides gracefully into the old port of Marseille. Ahoy there, Dante! Monsieur Morel! On that most fateful and accursed of days. Ah, we thought we lost you! Not a chance, monsieur! Thanks, sir, boy! Uh, hold on! I'm coming aboard! I'll have a rope lowered! February the 24th in the year 1815. Dead, Dantes? Captain Leclerc is dead? Fourteen long years before. The crew mourn him to a man. And you brought the Farron home in his stead? As was my duty as first mate. Did I do wrong? Wrong? <laughs> wrong? 
You may well have saved the business. You may well have saved Morel and Sons, boy. Oh, your father will be so proud of you. Hey, Dongla. Monsieur Morel? Is the cargo safe? Safe and sound and all accounted for. I have the complete inventory and if you like. that's to... all down to you, Edmund. Sorry? It was nothing. <laughs> nothing, he says. Well, Dongla, I wouldn't want to guess at the true contents of your sorry soul, but you and the rest of the crew must be down on your knees thanking the good Lord no, for sending no. us Dante's here <laughs> as Captain Leclerc's first mate. No. I can't speak for the rest of the crew, but my poor knees are quite worn to splinters from all that giving thanks. <laughs> <laughs> worn to splinters. Did you hear that, Dante? Tie them ropes off. Aye, aye. Wait, Francois, I'm coming. If you'll excuse me, Monsieur Morel, uh, Dongla. Dante's. Francois, give me the rope. What a find that young man is. I shall make him captain, I think. Of the Pharaoh. Seafaring talent like that can't go to waste. Well, indeed not, Monsieur Morel. Indeed not. Still, there is the matter of, um... Of what? Of our stop at Elba. Our unexpected stop. Most irregular. What on earth were you doing on Elba? Who can say? Well, I'm sure it was nothing. But well, for God's sake, man. Well, I did happen to glance in on poor Captain Leclerc as he lay dying and saw... Yeah, I'm sure it was nothing. You saw what? The captain give Dantes a package. Addressed to? My fortune teller, Monsieur Morel. All I know is that it delayed our arrival at Marseille by a good two days. Uh, isn't there something you should be doing, Dongla? I'm all done, I believe. Then lend a hand over there, will you? Not upset you, I hope, sir. You did ask. Yeah, not at all. It's just, just... I'm on my way. Dantes! Monsieur... What's this I hear about you stopping off at Elba? Was there some kind of emergency? No, there was no emergency. Captain Leclerc gave me a package for the Grand Marshal. The Grand? And did you deliver it? As instructed. It was an order. It was Captain Leclerc's last. I see. Listen, Edmund, while you were on Elba, you didn't happen to see... He came to speak with the marshal while I was there. Asked about the ship, its cargo. And when I mentioned your name, he recalled that he served with a Morel in Venice. You spoke with him? <laughs> For half a minute. And the emperor remembered my uncle Polygar? If that was his... Unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> All the same, Dante. Monsieur? One shouldn't be talking openly of conversations with Napoleon Bonaparte. Especially in public. No? Edmund, my boy, listen. It doesn't matter how fine a sailor you are, you can't afford to be naive. Not with the Emperor exiled and the King restored. This is France. Politics. Politics. Everything is politics. Do you know what was contained in the package you handed to the Marshal? No idea. I swear. Yeah. And long may it stay there. Customs are coming aboard with your permission. You're a good boy, Edmund. A good, good boy. And you are the best of men. Indeed, I consider myself to have two fathers. <laughs> my own and your own good self, monsieur. Uh, you will send my very best to your father, won't you? Uh, I will, sir. As soon as I'm done here, I intend to go straight home. Oh, you'd better look lively there, Dantes. After all, I understand there's also a certain young Catalan who will be very glad to know you're home safe. <laughs> Mercedes. The most eh? beautiful girl in all Marseille, they in, say. In all the world, monsieur. <laughs> Talk like that would charm a mermaid boy. Well, monsieur Morel. Oh, haven't you got anything better to do than pester me, Dongla? Did young Dantes give good reason for our stop at Elba? He did, Dongla. He did, yes. Now, I'd like to see the inventory. It's a shame to see him neglecting his duty. He neglected nothing. And he told you about the other letter? What other letter? The letter he was given along with the package by Captain Leclerc. I was sure he would have mentioned it. If that letter exists, then I'll ask for it and Edmund will give it straight to me. Uh, best not, monsieur. Let sleeping dogs lie, eh? Then why bring up the bloody thing, man? No, idle curiosity. Nothing more. I'd hate to see Dantes get into any kind of trouble. Times being what they are. I'll fetch you up that inventory. Maltese! Maltese! But Dantes' reverie is not to last. Daydreaming again, Maltese? Captain Patan. Something the matter with you, man? Not a thing. 
Set a course for the Isle of Monte Cristo. Monte Cristo? Someone step on your grave? Huh? I don't know the place, do you? I'll set a course straight away. And set a course for her he does, while his soul trembles with excitement and apprehension. Monte Cristo. Monte Cristo. Monte... What the hell's happened? Coast Guard Patrol, Captain Patan, port side. Can we outrun him? <laughs> no chance. Bastards will kill us! Maltese. Yes, Captain. Get yourself a gun. A gun? You know how to handle a gun, don't you? I do. And stand your ground. You may depend upon it. Ten minutes later, and the deck of the Jeune Amélie is soaked. Help me, Maltese! Help me! In blood. They're not saving you, pirate! <laughs> Lower your weapon. You're talking to me? Lower your weapon or I shoot. We are the king's coast guard. I answer to no earthly king. You what? You killed him, Ortiz. You bloody killed him. Are you all right? I, th I think so. Then let's get this done! Yeah! As dawn breaks across the sea, there is no sign of the Coast Guard or their scuttled boat. There is just the blue, blue water lapping in the still of the morning. Did what we had to do, lads. Coast Guard wasn't looking to bring any of us in for trial. You know it. I know it. Now I say we head to Monte Cristo. Leave last night to the sea. You with me? Aye. 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 What are we waiting for? Monte Cristo! <laughs> Maltese, when you're ready! With the gentlest of touches, the Jeune Amélie at last sails out across that lively sea where even the waves seem to sing Monte Cristo. Monte Cristo. Monte Cristo! Bring her in! Words cannot do justice to Dante's first glimpse of the barren Isle of Monte Cristo, with its outcrops of skull-white rock baking in the two o'clock sun. Drop anchor! With its flocks of wild goats scampering curiously this way and that as they take a first glimpse of the crew of the Jeune Amélie now setting up camp on that long, undisturbed beach. Maltese! Yes, Captain. You and Jacopo take a scout around the island while we set up camp down here. I'd sooner go on my own. Why? I'll be faster on my own. What are you standing there for? Dante's heart is fit to burst with anticipation. And Maltese! Yes, Captain? Bring us back some dinner! For over an hour, Dantes climbs and clambers across the rocks of Monte Cristo, the words of Abbe Faria repeating in his ears. Where the tried river bed ends and the ravine begins, those are the caves, are the caves where you are first to look. Remorselessly, the sun beats down upon poor Dantes, but no amount of heat will slow him in his quest. And after an hour following the river... The ravine. This must be the ravine. Maltese! Where are you, Maltese? Jacopo! Captain says he wants everybody back in the boat! On my way! Did you kill a goat for roasting? It's by the overhang over there. Oh. What do you think, then? Monte Cristo. I can see why nobody much bothers with it. Let's get back, shall we? Maltese. What? When the Coast Guard came aboard, uh -huh. it said you answered to no earthly king. It was his life or yours. Hey, and don't think I'm not grateful, but I still don't understand what... If that's so, then I hope you'll do something for me, Jacopo. Name it. Never question me like that again. Agreed? If you say so, Maltese. 
Oh, the goat's in that cave, yonder. <laughs> You're not going to try and jump that gap, are you? <laughs> watch me. But well, what if you fall between well, the I rocks? I know what I'm doing. Hey, you watch yourself. Always. You're not suggesting I leave you here, Maltese. I'm suggesting you finish your trade with the Turk and then send someone back to find me, Captain. Try and move, just a little. It's no good. My back, my back. I'll stay with him. That might be best. You need Jacobo on board with you, Captain. You know... You, you know you do. We'll leave you food, drink, and such provisions as you'll need. But mark my words, we'll be back for you, Maltese. Come, Jacopo! You look after yourself, my friend. You too. You too. I don't want to lose the wind, Jacopo! I'll make sure Patan's true to his word. Go! That you can die on us! Go! But no sooner has the jeune Emily set sail than... To work, Dantes. To work. Well, tried river bed ends and... The ravine begins. Those are the caves where you are first to look. You ask me, my most honoured friends, to describe the exact location of where Dantes at last discovers. <clears throat> Is this the cave, Abbe Faria? Is this the cave where you hid your treasure, my? Dear old friend. But now, as his eyes adjust to the dark of the cave, God be praised. he sees, dazzling, even in that pale half light. A cavern crammed tight with emeralds and diamonds and pearls without compare. It's not... it's not possible. Where he discovers such riches... ...as are not found in heaven. And at this moment... ...in a forgotten cave on the all but forgotten isle of Monte Cristo... Dead, you say? I'm sorry to say so. His true journey begins. Dantes is dead. He is. To Dantes. Dear departed Dantes. To Dantes. Won't you at least let me pour your glass of wine in his memory, Abbe Bassani? I am quite content with water. The sign of the inn of the Pont du Gard creaks. In even the slightest breeze. Did you uh, know poor Dante's well? I administered the last rites to him. Ah, oh, then he he died with a clear conscience. His death, I do assure you, Monsieur Cadrousse, was utterly wretched. But very few customers on that fly-bitten and dusty road outside Marseille ever stopped to hear it. May I ask what it was killed him? Prison killed him. That he survived as long as he did was a miracle in itself. Did you just catch... Habits one picks up. Now, fly away. <sighs> Perhaps you might say a prayer for Dante's. Let us look a little closer at the kindly, somewhat grizzled face of Abbe Busoni. You see how the Lord only punishes the good. I believe the Lord only punishes the wicked. And perhaps we may find features with which we are already acquainted. Well, there I would have to disagree with you. I take Dantes. Was Edmund Dantes good? I believed him to be a criminal. Oh, there's a lot I could tell you about that young man. Things that happened. There are. But honour demands silence. <coughs> oh, excuse me. You knew his father, I believe. Oh, old Louis Dantes. My poor heart breaks to even hear his name. How that man suffered. Petitioning the magistrates every day for some news of his son, receiving nothing. Awful, 
awful. He died of typhoid, I believe. Typhoid? He died of starvation. Starvation? Sure you weren't acquainted with old Dante's father? You say the old man petitioned every day. Stood on the steps outside the Crown Prosecutor's office. But Monsieur de Villefort would not receive him. De Villefort. In fact... The name is anguish. De Villefort denied even interviewing Dantes on the night of his arrest. Can't have been anybody else, though, can it? He was the man in charge. And is this Monsieur de Villefort still in Marseille? Oh, went straight to the top, did de Villefort. No flies on him. Made Crown Prosecutor of Paris. Crown Prosecutor? Yeah, make no mistake. This is a very powerful man we're talking about. Made his name hunting down Bonapartists, revolutionaries. Petrus! Yes, my butterfly. How many times have I said about drinking with a customers? But we don't have customers, do we? We never have customers. Now come down and talk with us, why don't you? Who's this, then? Allow me to present my wife, Matilde. Enchanted. Madam, I am the Abbe Bassoni, and I am an acquaintance of an old friend of your husband's. He's drunk with that beer, then. <laughs> now, now. His name was Edmund Dantes. Dantes? That's the boy that disappeared. The one you shh, said... Shh, 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 shh. Come and sit down. You knew him. Speak your business, Mr. Priest. Wine, my butterfly, wine. Shut up. Well... It was always Dante's avowed belief that he was wrongly accused and imprisoned. He spoke of it many times, and I must confess that I came to believe him. I'd like you to leave, Abbe. Uh, of course. One of that talk in my in. Allegations! I won't have it. I wasn't implying that you had any hand in it. Uh, there, there, there are issues surrounding the case. Issues, Abbe Bassoni, delicate issues. Of course, I quite understand there are sensitivities. I assume then that you won't be interested in what Dantes has bequeathed to you. Bequeathed to A us? A pleasure talking to you, well, Monsieur uh, Cadrus, uh, madam. What, 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 what did Dantes leave us? Well, I thought you wanted me well, to... Well, can't have been much, can it? Can't it? Glances... Curious, avaricious glances are exchanged between husband and wife. Glances the Abbe does not fail to note. For a few years, Dantes cared for a fellow prisoner who was incarcerated in the same cell as him, Lord Wilmore, an Englishman released after the collapse of the Republic and the restoration of King Louis. God save him! Quite. In gratitude, Wilmore left young Dantes this. What is that? Is that uh is this, this some sort of joke? I assure you it is not. Then what is it? It is what it looks like. Why, it looks like a diamond ring. The stone alone is worth 75,000 francs, I believe. And it was Dante's last wish that I sell it and divide its value five ways. A fifth to your good self, Monsieur <gasps> Cabrouse. A fifth to Dongla, who served with him upon the Ferrand, another to Fernand, the Catalan fisherman, another to his beloved fiancée, Mercedes, and a last fifth to his dear departed... Excuse me. To his dear departed father, Louis Dantes. But since I now learn that old Dantes is dead, then its value will have to be divided into four and shared amongst his remaining trusted friends. What do you say, monsieur? But at the inn of the Pont du Gard... There is only an astonished silence and the creak of a long neglected sign. I say there are things that you should know about these so called friends of poor Edmund Dantes. Things? Bolt the door, wife. The inn of the Pont de Gare is closed for the rest of the day. You mind if I uh, take a closer look at that ring? With pleasure. Oh. And you wouldn't be lying to us, Father. <laughs> Abbe Bassoni's a man of God, my butterfly. And I won't have him insulted with insinuations. Not while he rests beneath my roof. Now bolt the door. But I must tell you, in all seriousness, Abbe Bassoni, that the men of whom I'm about to speak are powerful, powerful people now. These friends of Dante. Very powerful. Do you understand? I'm not sure that they I... They could crush us. Easy as you could have crushed that fly. I see. So, where to begin? Where to begin? Light gleams now in the eyes of the innkeeper Cadrus. I suggest the beginning. A light as bright as diamonds glittering deliciously in a flame. Night before Dantes was arrested, we was all in this bar, just off the quayside, the marionette. 
There was me, Danglars, and the Catalan fisherman, Fernand. Go on. Of course, we're going back 15 years here, but I recall that night clear as if it was yesterday. Danglars had just returned from three months at sea with Dantes, and he had a right thirst on him. But the way I remember it, it was Fernand who said, Captain. <laughs> Old Morel made Edmund bloody Dantes captain of the Pharaoh. Tell the world, why don't you? But that's not right, Danglars. That's out of order, that is. You deserve captain, and I don't care who knows it. Dantes is a good man. He'll do well. To Dantes. To Dantes. Dantes. Always bloody Dantes. Did you see him in Mercedes on the quayside? Bloody Romeo and Juliet. He's only been away three months. Me. I've been at her side day after day, waiting for something, anything, some sign of affection. I even sing to her. So does a sweet little pussycat. You want to take this outside? Hey. Will you stop making a spectacle of yourself, Fernand? Well, I love her. I love her. And I'd sooner be captain of the Pharaoh. But we can't have everything in this life. Pass a bit more at wine, will you? It's only because you have never loved that you can be so callous. The only thing you want to do is get inside them pretty petticoats. I seen the way you look at her. Naughty, naughty for now. Another word and I'll cut your drunken throat, Kadrus, I will. Still, I do feel bad about one thing. And what's that? Protecting a traitor. Not doing my duty to the king. What are you talking about? Dantes has a letter. Don't know who it's addressed to exactly, but two days shy of getting back to Marseille, he decides to drop anchor at Elba. See the Emperor. You saying Dantes is plotting to bring Bonaparte back? I'm saying that I don't feel right about knowing what I do. As a loyal and true subject of His Majesty. That's why I wrote this. For the attention of the Crown Prosecutor, Monsieur de Villefort. Eat it quietly, man. Jesus. Don't look like you're writing. Because I disguised it, stupid. Read. For all the attention of the Crown Prosecutor, Monsieur de Villefort, regarding Edmund Dantes, first mate of the Pharaon, arriving today, 24th of February, 1815, at Marseille, Dantes holds a letter addressed to a member or members of the traitorous Bonapartist committee in Paris. Incontrovertible proof of his guilt will be made when the letter is found upon his person. Dantes may be discovered at his father's house or aboard the Pharaoh. Oh, my Danglars. You can't send that. It would destroy him. Why not? For no. Maybe it does go a bit far, Danglars. Ah, you're right. You're both right. I'm sorry I wrote it. Pass us that candle and I'll burn the note right now. Wait, wait. What? Just scrunch it up. Like this? Exactly like that. Now chuck it away. Done. You don't want to leave that thing lying about in here. Anyone could pick it up. Is that a fact? Have another drink, Kudrus. On me. What about the note? What about what? The no! Oh, it's nothing for you to worry about, Cadros. In fact, as I recall, you never saw any no, did you? And with that, Dungla and Fanon walked out of the bar, but... But? Night has wrapped its cloak about the scuffed old table, and only a solitary candle... But it was all a ruse. Gutters. Because no sooner had Fanon and Danglars made it look as if they'd left the bar, then back comes Fanon to retrieve the note and deliver it straight to the authorities. To De Villefort. You saw this. I was out in the alley, wasn't I? Taking myself a moment, if you know what I mean, dear Abbe. And you heard... Everything. Did you get the letter back, Fanon? I did, Danglars. I did. Oh. What do we do about Cadrus? Cadrus is a thief and a drunk. There's nobody going to take his word over ours. 
Perhaps he should have himself an accident. And draw attention to ourselves. Think, Fernal, think! All right, all right. No need to say it like... You're clear, Fernal. Clear about what will happen as soon as this letter is delivered. The consequences... Dantes will be arrested, Donglar. Dantes will be arrested, and more than likely thrown in jail for treason. Then that will be an end to him. And you can live with that. If it means you get to be captain of the Pharaoh, and I marry Mercedes, then... And nobody must ever know. Won't be me that opens his mouth. Then deliver the letter to the prosecutor's office. Why can't you go? Because I might be recognised, dummy. Who are you calling a dummy? Will you please just get a grip on that temper of yours? Now go. And did he go? Of course he did. Young Dantes was arrested at his wedding feast with Mercedes. Guards just marched right in, took him off to who knows where. But there's been a mistake. That's what they all say, Dantes. But I don't know what I'm supposed to have done. Oh, no! Save it for the Crown Prosecutor. Now get on your feet, Mercedes! Mercedes! And that was the last I heard of him, until you showed up here this evening. And Fernand and Dongla, what became of them? Fernand joins the army, doesn't he? Rises high, decorated. Bags himself the title of the Commander de Morcerf. Very nice, thank you. Commander de Morcerf. And Dongla is now an investment banker. And it's Baron Dongla, thank you very much. One of the richest men in Paris, they say. And very powerful. They both are. That's why we must be cautious, discreet. Then Edmond Dantes was betrayed both by Commander de Morcerf and Baron Dongla. On Jesus' blood, all I say here tonight is true. Then you were right, Abby Faria. Right about everything. What? My husband is a lot of things, but a liar he is not. Thank you both for your candor. If you would bring me my hat, Monsieur Cadrus, uh, of course. Uh, uh, aren't you forgetting something, um, about uh, Sainé? Uh, forgive me, my dear lady. Uh, there is just one more question I have. And that is? Mercedes, Dante's fiance. did she not wait for him? She waited for years, didn't she? The poor girl's heart was quite broken. Yeah. For two years, she resisted Fernand's advances, petitioned the court, until... Until? She accepted, finally, that her Edmund was never coming back and was most likely dead. That's when she married Fernand. After everything he did to Dante? Uh, don't suppose she had any idea, did she? Mm. They've even got a boy, I think. Uh... Oh, well, Albert. Albert. Mm. Quite the little prince, I hear. <laughs> I see. Well, then, what can I say? Monsieur Cadrus, madame. Oh, oh. <laughs> May Dante's diamond bring you all the happiness you deserve. Oh. <laughs> and Baron Dongla, Commander Fernand. Are not worth further discussion. Oh. <laughs> Bless you, Abby Bassani. Bless oh. you. An hour later, and Monsieur and Madame Cadrus consider their good fortune. We should go get it valued. I'll be sure to do that tomorrow. I'll come with you. It's a while since I got to Marseille. Believe it best if you stay here, wife. A hey, pardon? Said it would be better if you stayed here. What was that supposed to mean? Husband! Time to fly away, my little butterfly. Get away from me! Cadruce! Get away from me! While at the side of the road, in the depths of that dry and savage night, a man sits, weeping, for all that he has so grievously lost. I'm sorry, I'm, um, I'm not sure I quite caught the name. Lord Wilmore. We've heard this name before. And our business is? Edmund Dantes, imprisoned in the Chateau d'If. And we have met this man before. Disguised first as a corpse, and later as a priest. I'm looking for information. You've dropped some coins, your lordship. Six hundred francs, if I'm not mistaken. 
Would you say it was enough to gain a glance at an old prison record? Six hundred. The Dante's file would be kept here in the public records office. Uh, Edmund Dante's. It would. It would. Then... Edmund Dante's. Uh, Edmund Dante's. Ah, here it is. Uh, the, the case file. Right at the very bottom. It appears somebody may have attempted to bury it. It would seem so. Although you do know that this prisoner tried to escape from the Chateau d'If. I didn't know that. About a year or so ago, quite the scandal it was. Disguised himself as the corpse of an old priest. <laughs> Heavens. Fazir or Faria or some such. The two of them were in cahoots, apparently. They'd even dug some sort of a tunnel between their cells. Desperate measures, eh? Then this Dante's is at large. No, no, sir. Not a chance. Nobody escapes the deef. Dante's was thrown into the sea. Cannonball about his feet. He's dead. Drowned, without a doubt. Would you mind if I took a look at it, uh, the file? Be my guest, your lordship. And are these notes on the arrest papers from um, De Villefort? Uh, that, uh, that's the Crown Prosecutor's signature, yes. The notes would have been taken on the night of Dantes's arrest. I see. Is there anything else I can do for you, Lord Wilmore? You've been more than helpful, Monsieur Beville. Thank you. There they are. A little faded, but quite distinguishable. The words Dantes has dreaded for so very long. Regarding Edmund Dantes, fanatical Bonapartist, plotted to return Bonaparte from Elba, solitary confinement in the Chateau d'If, close supervision. N-A-T-B-T. -T. Uh, well, what do these letters signify? May I see? No action to be taken. It means the prisoner, Dantes, was considered to be too dangerous to be released. Ever? It would seem so. And the handwriting is... That of de Villefort, the Crown Prosecutor. It's definitely his hand. I've seen that signature a thousand times. And these letters here? Uh, are petitions from one... Mercedes Roas, Louis Dantes, the prisoner's father, and Monsieur Morel, the prisoner's employer, ran the trading firm Morel and Sons down at the old port. Ran? I hear the old man Morel's fallen on hard times. Apparently the company's on the very brink of collapse. Such a fine family, too. A shame, really. Where were we? Let's call our agreed sum a thousand. Your lordship, I don't know what to say. I can, of course, trust upon your discretion. Of course, of course, absolutely. Lost? The Ferron is lost? Yeah, but the crew survived. I had confirmation from Penelon, the first mate. But the loss of the Ferron must have dire implications for your business, Monsieur Morel. Dire implications. It means we are ruined, sir. Lord Wilmore, face shadowed, eyes narrowed, stares intently at the worried man before him, a man worry has made stooped, nervous. And now you are come to me today with, I'm sure, a final demand for all that we owe your company in Rome, Lord Wilmore. Actually, the contrary. Beg pardon? I am authorised by Messrs. Thompson and French of Rome to extend your credit. It is all here. Extended? I assume that this will help you manage your business for at least three more months. But your lordship, without a boat... As a resourceful man of business, you have my every confidence. But this is more than we could possibly have hoped for. Yes. Allow me to shake your hand once more, Lord Wilmore. Monsieur Morel, I assure you that this decision is based solely on your solid business performance over the last 40 years. Let us not be sentimental. Oh, indeed not. Then please accept this note of security. I... 
I don't know what to say. Well, when one discovers oneself to be at a loss for words, it is always good advice, I find, to say nothing. <laughs> we shall meet again on the morning of September the 5th, at which time we shall reassess your financial situation. Is that acceptable? Oh, more than acceptable. Until the 5th. Until then. And now, as old man Morel gathers his wife and daughter to share in his unexpectedly good news... Lord Wilmore walks purposefully towards his handcrafted yacht, exhaustively fitted with every conceivable comfort. Welcome aboard, sir. Thank you, Jacopo. But no sooner is Lord Wilmore aboard, and away from the prying eyes of the always curious Marseillais... Successful meeting, Maltese? Most satisfactory. Then he removes his ostrich-feathered hat and ornately laced collar and gently tugs off his soft leather boots, unmistakably revealing... Jacopo. Edmond Dantes. I need you to listen carefully to me. Yes, sir. There is a man I would like you to find right away. His name is Penelon. Tell him that if he loves the morels, as I know he does, then he's to do all that is asked of him without question. Straight away. And Jacopo. Yes, sir. Discretion. Always, Maltese. But three months pass as swift as wasps. Leave me be, Maximilian. Please. About spilt honey. I insist that you open this door. Did I not make myself clear? Perfectly. <clears throat> what are you doing? Father? Not another step, Maximilian. And, and, and please don't interfere. The gun is loaded. As is mine. What? I've come to join you, Father. Join me? Let us both die here today. As father and son, in these once proud offices of Morel and Sons. Family honour requires only my blood. Our bankruptcy besmirches us all. I insist I die with you. But who will look after your mother and sister if we both take our lives today? My mind is quite made up. I, I, and who will tell Lord Wilmore our business is collapsed, if not you, Maximilian? Is he coming today? September the 5th. But honour demands... Family honour demands my death, not yours, Max. Thank you, Mother, for, for all that we have been blessed with over the years. Attend to your sister Julie, too. She is your responsibility now. Father! Father! The door, Maximilian. I don't want your sister distressed. Oh, of course. Oh, this may not be the best time for, for any... For what? You must listen to your brother, Julie. A gun, Father? These are not matters that concern you. Not matters that... Max? Honour demands. Honour demands that you look at this. Is that... A diamond? It is. From where? I don't know, but I've received a letter from some person who signed himself as Sinbad. Sinbad? And, according to the letter, it is Sinbad's greatest sorrow to see the once great name of Morel brought low. So for that reason, he wanted me to accept this diamond on your behalf. It is out of the question. Completely out of the question. Who is this Sinbad? From the tone of his letter, I sensed that he was very familiar with our family. But the diamond is not the reason I'm here, Father. It isn't. The Pharon is saved. What? It's coming into port right now. Morel and Sons is saved from ruin, Father. See for yourself. What can this really be? The eyeglass. Uh, uh, fetch me the eyeglass. Here you are. That's Penelon. That's Penelon on the deck. And, and he's waving. Morel and Sons is saved, Max. <laughs> Save! Oh, 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 my, my, my hat! Where's my hat? We, we must get down there immediately. Put the guns away, man. Yes, yes, Father. The Lord be praised! But we cannot linger here, my most honoured friends. We cannot watch as the Faron is unloaded and the fortunes of the family are reversed. Nor can we afford to idle away a minute or two, studying the familiar features of the gentleman in the canary yellow cloak who observes this scene from the shadows of a vintner's doorway and who brushes away a solitary tear as he gives the signal Set a course for Greece, Jacopo. Straight away, Moses. To set sail. Good night, be there, lads! We sail within the half hour! I don't know what more I can say about him, Maximilian. But he must have told you something about himself. Anything? 
All I know is that I owe him my life. Of course you recognise our location, my most honoured guests. Honestly, Maximilian, he's like some kind of benevolent octopus with an invisible network of tentacles spreading every which way at once. An octopus? And you arranged to rendezvous with him today? Ten o'clock at my apartments on the 21st of May. Yes, we are in Paris, in the fashionably decorated drawing room of one of its most eligible bachelors. <laughs> Do try to look just the tiniest bit interested, Max. Albert de Morcerf. I am. And did we not last see his guest, Maximilian Morel, on a quayside in Marseille some ten long years before? Oh, he is, without doubt, the most extraordinary fellow. For now it is time to speak of the cataclysm. Excuse me, sir. The cataclysm in Paris. Yes, my sir? There is a gentleman at the door, sir. He says he has an appointment with you. Did he give a name? He did, sir. The Count of Monte Cristo. In The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas, adapted by Sebastian Bonchkevich, Edmund Dantes is played by Ian Glenn, Ede by Jean Lapotere, Abbe Faria by Richard Johnson, and Monsieur Morel by Robert Bly. Dongla is Toby Jones. Fernand, Zubin Varla. Cadrus, Ben Crow. Mathilde, Liza Sadovy. And Jacopo, Joe Sims. Captain Patin is played by Patrick Brennan. Albert de Morcerf by Will Howard. Max Morel by Adam Nagaitis. Julie Morel by Eleanor Crooks. And Claude by Paul Stonehouse. The music is by David Tobin and Jeff Megan. And the directors are Jeremy Mortimer and Sasha Yevtushenko. Tomorrow, the Count of Monte Cristo continues his slow revenge on his enemies. What if an apparent meteor shower was actually the invasion fleet of an alien race? What if they were incubating in the ocean deeps until they were ready to begin their war of attrition against the human race? That is the scenario for the great sci-fi author John Wyndham's classic tale, The Kraken Wakes. On BBC Radio 4 Extra this weekend, you can hear an adaptation by Val McDermid, who retells this dramatic novel in light of contemporary fears of climate change. Two radio reporters are drawn into the story as it unfolds. Asteroids that disintegrate do not choose where they land. So are, are you saying the fireballs are intelligent? Intelligent or programmed, it's academic, really. So the question is, where did they come from? No, no, no. The question is predicated on the fact that somewhere in the order of 3,000 fireballs have gone down and nothing has come back up again. How on earth can they survive if they're at the bottom of the ocean, where the pressure is an unimaginable 750 kilos per square centimeter? And what? are they doing down there? Maybe they just disintegrated. Oh, let us hope so, my dear. Let us hope so. Starring Tamsin Gregg, Paul Higgins and Richard Harrington, The Kraken Wakes in Radio 4 Extra's Seventh Dimension, starting on Saturday night at six o'clock and midnight. Hailstones the size of Mint Imperials have hit the Peak District. Local residents describe the extreme weather as a breath of fresh air. <laughs> the new series of News Jack, the topical show making sure no political, economic or social stone is unturned. It's been a good week for public health as vehicles are banned from idling outside... The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Adapted by Sebastian Bonchkevich Part 2 Of course, Dongla is consumed with envy, but he'd never go so far as to actually admit it. And this Count of Monte Cristo has called upon your husband. Paris is cold for me. Apparently, he requested a line of credit at the bank worth over six million francs. Six million? According to Dongla, he is as rich as Croesus, and the apartment he has bought himself. Oh, the pride of the Champs-Élysées. Goodness. 
Not that anyone's actually seen it, of course. But Paris is also alive with rumour. He received no visitors. Eight weeks in town and not one invitation, despite his being invited to every fashionable salon there is. No. Outrageous, isn't it? Speaking of outrageous, I take it you've seen the front page of this morning's newspaper. I have. And I, for one, do not believe a word of it. Commander Fernando Morcerf, a national traitor. Nonsense. <laughs> Your husband should be ashamed for printing it. My words, exactly. But will Dongla listen? As far as I'm concerned, the mere fact that the de Morcerfs are proceeding as planned with this year's spring ball proves, categorically proves, that the commander has nothing, absolutely nothing, to answer for. Do you suppose the count is invited? One would imagine so. Monsieur de Villefort will prosecute the case if it ever comes to that, I assume. Oh, please, don't even speak of it, dear Hermine. <sighs> People have been coming and going all morning. To be honest, it's a blessing to be out of the house. Oh, how very inconvenient it must be for all of you. Edouard, I do not worry about. He's such a wonderful, wonderful child. <laughs> Indeed. But Valentine, oh, to be perfectly honest with you, I am at something of a loss as to what to do with that silly girl this afternoon. She's so... She's so very... Valentine. Uh, take the dappled greys out for a ride. Oh, no. Uh, why not? The carriage waits in the courtyard. Oh. But let us now attend, most honoured friends, to the clatter of hooves and wheels on the cobbled streets as they thunder towards those same apartments, the apartments of the Count of Monte Cristo. And watch as... <laughs> terrifying, eh? What's happening to your brother and all our vanity? They suddenly found her. I just can't imagine how it can have happened, Count. No. And let us now witness the first act of the cataclysm the Count has come to wreak on those who so maliciously betrayed him. One minute we were in the carriage, and the next, the next, the horses are, are... Whatever happened, do you think? I have no idea. The rearing. Oh. Oh, drink a little more of this, Madame de Villefort. <sighs> I can't think what we would have done if your man had not been there to assist us. I cannot. No. What is this? A tonic to revive you. Nothing more. And Edouard? Where's Edouard? He and Valentine are next door. Are they all right? I believe Valentine is reading and Edouard is playing contentedly with his toys. If anything were to happen to that most dearest of boys, then I don't know. I really don't know mm. what I would do. And Valentine? <sighs> Valentine is more, how does one say it politely, self-contained. Hmm. Takes after her late mother, my husband's first wife. Then she is not your daughter. Oh, heavens no. <laughs> this Alexia is really very good. Was it made from some sort of compound? It was. Of what elements? Is chemistry an interest? To a frivolous, silly woman such as myself, but yes, Count, yes. The light that science casts on the invisible world has always fascinated. In that case, I would be delighted to enlighten you. Oh. And as the wife discovers the secrets of the Count's elixir, so the husband... Order, order! This emergency tribunal will come to order. Monsieur de Vifo. Makes his case. The allegations prepared by the Crown Prosecutor's Office against Commander Fernand de Morcerf are as follows. One, that during the war against Turkey ten years ago, he actively conspired with the Turkish authorities against our ally, the potentate Ali Pasha. Two, that he profited personally from this act of treachery. And three, that this betrayal led directly to the assassination of one of France's most trusted allies, as well as ensuring the eventual victory of the enemy. Order! Order! No matter how unpalatable the members of this committee may find these allegations, it is my intention to provide you with an eyewitness tomorrow who will directly corroborate all that the Crown alleges. 
Good afternoon, gentlemen. What always intrigues me about this particular elixir is how easily it can be appropriated into something infinitely more dangerous. Dangerous? In what way? As you have just demonstrated, a simple readjustment of the chemicals is enough to produce a deadly poison. Poison? So subtle, one would have difficulty believing the victim had died for anything but natural causes. Uh, very macabre. But I think that perhaps Madame de Villefort has had enough of her chemistry lesson for one day. It was most diverting, my dear Count. A pleasure. And may I say how magnificent these apartments of yours are? They are nothing to what my house in Otoy will be. Your house in Otoy? A house I hope that you and your husband will do me the great honor of visiting. Number 28 Rue de la Fontaine. I'm sure Monsieur de Villefort will only be too delighted. Although I trust you are not afraid of ghosts. Whatever do you mean? Well, the house comes with a most curious story. But I'm sure you were in much too much of a hurry to hear it. <laughs> I believe you are toying with me, monsieur. <laughs> I? Yes, you. Well, the story goes that there were once two lovers. He, a young widower, she, a beautiful heiress. Not long after their secret affair commenced, she found she was with child. Neither could afford the attendant scandal, and in their desperation, they decided to bury their newborn under a tree. <laughs> where the pathetic remains were, tragically, unearthed many years later. Dear God, who would do such a thing? And it is said that one can still hear the infant's ghostly wails in the night. Of course, it is just a nonsensical story. Of course. <laughs> And I have taken up far too much of your time. Not at all. Now, I, I, I shall gather up the children and, and bid you adieu. Will I be seeing you at the spring ball this evening? Sadly, no. <laughs> My husband does not believe it appropriate. These dreadful allegations against Commander de Mosseur. Oh, yes, the allegations. Well, naturally, I don't believe a word of it, but my husband is, well, the Crown Prosecutor... Are the children through here? They are. Then I shall see myself out, and thank you again. I've never seen a house like it. Oh. Yes, Grandfather, the Count of Monte Cristo. They say he's even wealthier than you. Wealthier? Possible? Not. <laughs> <laughs> the house of the Crown Prosecutor, Gérard de Villefort, it's a tall, somewhat gloomy house on the Champs-Élysées. And tonight he is going to the Spring Ball. All of Paris cannot stop talking about him. The stories one hears. Slaves. And in its attic sits an old man whom illness has all but struck silent. No. And his beloved granddaughter, no. Valentine de Villefort. I was to attend, but... Father has forbidden it on account of these charges against Commander de Morcerf. And I was so looking forward to going, because among the invited guests is... is... is. Oh, that I might see him for just a moment. <laughs> oh, Grandfather. Grandfather. He is of good family. Who? I cannot tell you. I wish I could, but I cannot. Father would never allow it. Cry. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> you look truly beautiful tonight, eh, Day? Now at last, most honoured friends, it is time for me to make my first... You shall dazzle them all. ...appearance. My master exaggerates. You're trembling, child. Forgive me, master, but I am afraid. Of what? Of seeing him again. I shall be at your side. No harm will befall you. But if Commander de Morsef recognizes me? Remember, I am always with you. After you. But for the briefest of moments, the Count hesitates. I do not believe I can do this. And in his head... Countess. A voice. How am I ever to endure this night? The voice of his beloved and long-dead friend and fellow prisoner. By remembering that you carry out God's will. Abbe Faria. 
But if I fail him... You are God's instrument, here to carry out his divine will and take his just revenge on... on... Fernand de Morsef. Trust in him, and you cannot fail. You cannot. You are, as ever, my truest guide. Now go, Dantes. Go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Count of Monte Cristo and Mademoiselle Eve. Excited, curious eyes now peer over exquisitely ornamented fans, and sharp, curious glances bolt wild as white lightning across that ballroom bedecked with flowers. Remember what I taught you, Lady. Never look down. And it is now that I see him. So we meet at long last, monsieur. You must be the Count of Monte Cristo. An honor. Fernand de Morcerf at your service. Commander de Morcerf, permit me to introduce a day. Enchanted. The man who murdered my father. My mother. My brothers. My sisters. The man who now gently takes my hand in his. Yes. The man who now raises it to his... Enchanted. Lips. May I ask how long you have both been in Paris? A few weeks. Your son, Albert, has been most hospitable. And has my son had the great good fortune to be introduced to the charming Ada? I do not believe he has yet had that pleasure. Perhaps you were on an errand for me that day. Perhaps, master. An errand? Ada is part of your household. She is my slave. Your... Oh. I bought her in a market in Constantinople some ten years ago. She was a child then, barely nine, I believe. The blue of her eyes was what first caught my attention. They are indeed lustrous, Count. And had obviously seen such terrible suffering. And did you learn much about her history? I learnt enough. Which was? That she was the daughter of a cruelly betrayed sultan, and as a consequence of that betrayal had suffered the most terrible misfortunes. We've not met before, have we, Count? I do not believe we have. But I understand you have visited Baron Danglars. In fact, we spoke of you amongst many other things. You spoke of me? Only in the most roundabout of terms, you understand. Well, it's a pleasure to make your acquaintance at last. The honour was mine. I hope that you will both enjoy the ball. Indeed. Count, a day. But as the commander walks across the hall, he does not so much as look at another of his fashionable guests. Instead, he opens the side door and disappears into his study. Albert. Yes, father? I need you to take over my duties tonight. Dear God. Tell me what's happened. It was Monte Cristo. Your friend, Monte Cristo. What was? It was he who has spread this terrible rumour against me. I know it is. You must be mistaken. I am not mistaken, the girl. What girl? The girl he is with. You're not making any sense, father. Please, Albert. If he has dishonoured you, then demand satisfaction. I can't do that, not with this wretched tribunal tomorrow. How the devil do you know this Monte Cristo anyway? He, he saved me from bandits in Rome. And is a bandit himself. Then honour demands that I... Honour be damned. Very well. If you will not do something about this... Albert! Albert! I can't tell you how delighted we were finally to see you at our house, Count. Uh, Baron Dongla is indeed a financial sorcerer. I'm sure my husband was only too happy to assist you. And may I say that that is a most bewitching sable you're wearing. It was a gift. Uh, from your devoted husband, I assume? <laughs> For shame, Count. I thought that was you, Hermine. Mercedes, at last. <laughs> you have out done yourself as ever, my dear. A decor quite magnificent. Oh, thank you. And have you met the Count of Monte Cristo? I have heard so very much about you. And for the tiniest moment, Madame, she falters. Oh, forgive me. You are most welcome to our home. As if startled by a half-remembered presence. Thank you. 
And of course, I wanted to thank you personally for the great service you did my son in Rome. I was only too glad to have been of assistance. For a moment, the briefest of moments, the Count is no longer here, but racing along a quayside in Marseille. Mercedes! Mercedes! With his heart fit to burst with love and longing, as he all but sprints to her rickety house on that long ago day at the end of February, 1815. Your home! Your home! 25 years before. When did you get back? Just an hour ago. Is something wrong? Wrong? What could possibly be wrong? Then you've missed me. (laughs) Come here, Edmund (sighs) Dondes. Oh, I, I spoke to my father, Mercedes. Tonight, we will celebrate our marriage feast at last. The room is booked. It's all arranged. <gasps> and we are finally to be married. In just a few weeks. <laughs> oh, and that's not all. What, Edmund? Well, you'd probably not be interested. <laughs> what? Well, Monsieur Morel wants me as captain of the Ferrand. <gasps> as captain? That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, return to us at last, Dantes. <sighs> Fenon! <laughs> How are you, my friend? Never better. I hope Fenon has been taking good care of you in my absence, Mercedes. He has been most attentive. Then I am indebted to you. You're coming to our marriage feast tonight, I hope. You're... May I speak with you for a moment, Mercedes? <laughs> if Edmund permits. As long as you be sure to give her back to me. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> what did I ever do to be treated so hard? Oh, not again, Fernand. Especially not here. But then there is no hope for me, for us. There is, and there never was any us. When he ever... Well, then I cannot, I cannot live. Don't do this, please. Fernand! Congratulations to you, Dantes. To you both. If you will excuse me. Uh, Fernand? Oh, leave him, Edmund. Did I do something to upset him? Let us take him at his word. But let us follow the scheming Fernand. Now you're clear, Fernand. To that alleyway in the old port of Marseille. Clear about what will happen as soon as this letter is delivered? The consequences? To his rendezvous with Danglars. Dantes will be arrested. Dantes will be arrested and more than likely thrown in jail for treason. Then that will be an end to him. And you can live with that? If it means I marry Mercedes, then... And nobody must ever know. Won't be me that opens his mouth. To their betrayal and malicious denunciation of the innocent Edmond Dantes. Monte Cristo! Albert! It is you who has dishonoured our family's good name. Do you deny it? I do. Then please, identify the young lady who accompanies you tonight. Her name is Ede, and she is, I believe, the daughter of the late Sultan Ali Pasha. And you bring her here, to this house? As I was invited to do. My glove, sir. Please, don't do this, Albert. Shall we say the banks of the Seine? If that is what you wish. My second will call upon you at first light, the day after tomorrow. Will that be convenient? It will. Very well, then. Albert! Paris whirls into a hive of whispers. The ball was suddenly over. A scandal. Imagine. He has no soul, they say. Oh! The Count of Monte Cristo. And he never loses. Never. And as the night turns into the first light of day, the Count and I sit quietly together in my beautifully appointed chambers overlooking the Champs-Élysées. And if this tribunal won't believe me? They will believe you, Ede. You must have faith. Commander de Morcef is a national hero. He is also a murderer. Will you come with me to court? It will be better if you go on your own, but I shall be here waiting. Depend upon it. You are my most loving master. There is no need to address me so. But am I not your slave? In name alone. Away from you, I have no freedom. Surely the day must come when a child liberates herself from her parent, no matter how benign they may be. But you are not my parent, and I am very far from considering myself your child. I am not sure I take your meaning, Ede. 
Will that traitorous devil, Fernando Mosef, at last pay for his crimes? Thanks to you, he will. Yes. Then my family will finally be avenged. Sleep now, child. And as the Count closes the door and descends to his study, another study door... Have you any idea what time it is, Commander? ...is opened. I do, Baron Donglar. Yes. But I have come to you on a matter of some urgency. Which is what, may I ask? The conversation you had with your good friend, the Count of Monte Cristo. Now, now, Fernand. No need for the tone. What on earth do you think you're doing? Focusing your attention, I hope. Have we not seen these two together before? In a small, dirty alley in the old port of Marseille? I don't know what it is you think I can do for you. I think you can publish a retraction of the accusations against me. I am merely the paper's proprietor, not its editor. Don't play me for a fool. Publish a retraction. Provide me with some evidence supporting your position and I will gladly do so. Of course, they were both a little leaner then. <coughs> a little hungrier. What did this Count of Monte Cristo tell you? <laughs> well? He merely mentioned mentioned in passing that he had heard tell of a high-ranking French officer being involved in the betrayal of Ali Pasha to the Turks. Oh. We had our man out there do a little investigating. And... And... You know what you did, Fernand. <laughs> tribunal or no tribunal. This isn't happening. You were always greedy. Even back when you were a nobody fisherman in Marseille, mooning over that peach Mercedes. I will make you pay for this. Mark my words. Oh, before you go. What? Regarding the wedding arrangements between your son Albert and my Eugenie, yeah, it might well be prudent for us to, given the circumstances, I don't know. Why you... Cancelling our agreement. Reputation, my dear Fernand. It's all about reputation. Madame de Morcerf. Monsieur. A great pleasure to see you once again, madame, and my thanks for a most diverting evening. I shall come straight to the point of my visit, if I may. Of course. My son. Yes? But watch, most honoured friends, as her resolve deserts her as she is confronted now by those cold blue eyes, searching out, it seems, the deepest chasms of her heart. I believe my son was a friend to you. I still consider him so. And am I, then, by extension, a friend also, Count? I am at your service, madame. But are we friends? Observe them there together. Eyes fixed steadily upon the other, as if each dares the other. Perhaps when we are a little better acquainted. To breathe. Are you sure I cannot offer you any refreshment, some coffee, perhaps? May I speak frankly? By all means. You have suffered greatly, I think. Suffered? In your life. You have lost attachments. Perhaps loved ones. The point of your question, madame. But you are not unhappy now. My present happiness is on an equal par with my former disappointments. I am not sure I take your meaning. No. No. You are married, monsieur? I have not had that good fortune. You are unattached? I am. The girl who accompanied you yesterday, the girl who now gives evidence against my husband. My slave, a day. There was a girl, since you ask, a girl I once loved in Malta. Malta? Long time ago, 25 years. While I was unfortunately lost at sea, she discovered she loved another. It is an old song, often sung. Perhaps my youthful heart was not as resilient to disappointment as it might have been. And you are sure she found she loved 
another? As sure as you were standing there before me, madame. There could be no mistake. You have never thought to return to Malta to seek her out? No. And have you forgiven her? Her, I have forgiven. Others, those who engineered our separation, I have not. But who could have engineered your separation? Did you not just say you were lost at sea? Did I? Spare my son's life, monsieur. It is he who has challenged me. Then I beg you. I need not remind you of the verdict of that stony-eyed tribunal. Thanks in no small part to the evidence I now give on this miserable Parisian afternoon. Father? Yes, Albert. What are you doing? I need not remind you of the public vilification heaped upon the house of the unmasked traitor Fernand de Morcerf. Arranging my affairs. Or of the warrant now issued for his immediate arrest. The girl who accompanied the Count last night. Ade. Well done, her. Her evidence to the tribunal this afternoon. If you've something to say, boy. Is it true, father? The thing she accuses you of betrayal, treason. What do you think? I'm asking you. Whatever I did or did not do, I did for my family. Then the allegations are genuine. You really did betray the Sultan Ali Pasha, engineered the slaughter of his entire family. What oh, man? Everything we have, everything I am, a lie. Goodbye. Answer me, Father. As I have already said, madame, the matter is out of my hands. Then you are resolved to duel with my son tomorrow morning. Honor demands it. The girl in Malta. What about her? Have you ever heard from her? She has long forgotten me. Did you never think to seek her out and ask her? I believe she married one of those who betrayed me. I have no idea what you're talking about, monsieur. I believe you, Madame de Morcerf. I do. The son cannot be held responsible for the crimes of his father. No matter how heinous, lose this duel. I beg you. Then you are asking me to die. We shall see. We shall see? A most pleasant visit, madame. Jacobo will show you out. I can find the door without him. Thank you. And I'm sorry. For what? For everything we have both lost. And as the sun sets on that dreadful day... Count! Our attention must journey... Am I to assume that you are Albert II, Monsieur Morel? I am. ...to the rising of the sun, as it illuminates those quiet banks of the Seine. Is he not with you? He must be delayed. I take it he has heard the tribunal's verdict against his father. One assumes so. We have met before, have we not? We have, at Albert's apartments. A happier rendezvous than this, I think. It was, I believe, your very first day in Paris. Morel, you say? Yes. Not at all related to Morel and sons of Marseille. Pierre Morel was my father. You knew him? Only by repute. He is well, I hope. He died some time ago. My sincere condolences. Thank you. Count, at last. You are late, monsieur. I must beg your forgiveness. Albert. There is no need to kneel. I have accused you falsely. Uh, you have me at a disadvantage. My father was, I believed, a soldier, a commander, above all, a man of honour. I believed all of these things of him without question. 
All of them. Get up, Albert. But Please. I realise now that he is, in fact, a traitor. That my entire life has been based on an, on an infamous lie. It was never my intention to dishonour you, Count. Please, accept my sincere gratitude for all that you have done for me. Adieu. Wait, Albert. Wait! Harris, it seems, is in uproar. Disappeared. Almost without trace. Well, is he armed? I believe so. In that case, alert your best officers, initiate a manhunt. I want the traitor Fernand de Morcef standing before me in the dock this afternoon. Are we really not taking anything with us, Mama? Nothing. But what will become of the house? The, the, the furniture? The state will take it all in compensation for your father's crimes. And father? Is a wanted man. We must do our best to forgive him. Where will we go? Home. To Marseille. Mother, wait. Yes? I hope you will not be too disappointed in me. Whatever's happened? I have accepted a commission with the Dragoons. The Dragoons? My mind is quite made up. How else is the good name of de Morcerf ever to be reclaimed? In that case, what choice do I have? God bless you, Mother. And thank you. Now, I would very much like to leave this house. Monte Cristo! Leave... And never return. Monte Cristo. Commander de Morcerf. You just barged in there, sir. Thank you, Jacopo. That will be all. Shall I not alert the authorities? Not just at this second, no. But I... I... That will be all, Jacopo. May I offer you some brandy, Commander? Brandy? Or wine? Are you mocking me? No. I trust your wife and son are well. My wife and son have abandoned me. I'm sorry to hear that. Are you? Are you really? I am. You see, I very much wanted to see for myself the face of the man who has actively sought to destroy me. In order for you to accomplish that, you need only find yourself a looking glass. What did you say? I said you need only find yourself a looking glass. You know that I could kill you where you stand? I know that you could try. Is that a threat? It is a simple statement of fact. Do you know who I am? All too well. I assume your man has gone to alert the authorities. A day was barely eight years old when I bought her. A child in a dirty cage. Your little slave girl testified against me in open court. Lied. You stop deluding yourself, Fernand. You dare to address me by my Christian name? I do. Then again, you have me at a disadvantage, monsieur. Do you really not know me? Of course I don't know you. I think perhaps your wife may have recognized me. Mercedes was here. She is still as beautiful as she ever was, isn't she? What business have you with my wife? And to think that we were engaged to be married. Once upon a time. Dantes. Edmund. Dantes. You seem surprised. This is a trick. A jest. Fourteen years in the Chateau de. Oh, get away from me! Ignored, forgotten, left to die. And all thanks to a piece of paper falsely denouncing me as a traitor to the authorities. It was Dongla. Dongla, who wrote that note? And you, who delivered it. How could you know that? I know what occurred in Marseille that night in every particular thing. That Edmond Dantes is dead. Dead. Really? How can this be happening. <laughs> and now, at last, you know what it is to have everything you have ever loved taken away from you. I could kill you. I could. This pistol's loaded. Hard to kill a dead man, wouldn't you say? 
I'd imagine your execution will attract quite a crowd, don't you? You'll be the talk of all Paris. <laughs> Dongla. Dongla and I will meet in due course. You may depend upon it. Oh, help me. Don't. Please. No. no. I cannot be arrested. The disgrace. There is no alternative. Unless. Unless. You hold the solution in the palm of your hand. Goodbye, Fennel. Oh, oh, you don't want to watch me die? I believe I already have. The first blossoms of spring tumble every which way along the bright and airy boulevards of the always magnificent Paris, heralding at last the first stir of summer as they flutter hopelessly against the locked and shuttered windows of the house of the traitor de Morcerf, who even now, most honored friends, raises a gleaming silver pistol to his forehead. And now a single shot in a darkened room echoes along every shadowy street and alley until its reverberations reach even the oh-so-beautifully-decorated apartments of one of the most desired addresses in Paris. My dear Count... Baron Donga, what an absolute delight. That came as soon as I heard. Heard? Uh, that the traitor de Morcerf was here, in this very room. A matter best forgotten. Uh, dangerous man, de Morcerf. Ruthless. Always was. Well, he's quite dead now, is he not? With a pistol given him by the king, apparently. The irony. Was there some other reason for your visit, Baron Dongla? Uh, it's not that it isn't always a pleasure, but... Uh... Well, yes, Count. Actually, there was. You see, now that Albert de Morcerf has left Paris in disgrace, well, obviously, my beautiful daughter Eugenie is suddenly no longer affianced. A fiance. My point is, the young man you mentioned when we discussed extending you the credit of my bank. Your ward. And... And... and Andrea Cavalcanti. The very fellow. What about him? I wondered if he might not be a more suitable suitor for my Eugenie. Why? The same thought had actually crossed my mind. It had? Do you doubt me? Oh, th this is news without compare, sir. Without compare? Well, we must meet the boy as soon as is possible. Well, you surely don't imagine that I will provide you with a date this instant, Baron. Oh, of course not, my dear Count. Perish the thought. It, it's just that my wife and I are keen to know you so very much better. Oh, you will come to know me better, Baron. Depend upon it. Good. Marvellous. Oh, and, um, I take it the credit I afforded to you is quite sufficient for your needs? Perfectly so. Ah. In that case, I shall, uh... Indeed. Au revoir. Hey. As Paris settles into early summer and street lights hiss into golden light, a carriage... Resolute as death, now pulls up outside the Count's apartments. Maltese. Yes, Jacopo. Looks like you have another visitor. Crown Prosecutor Gerard de Vifor. I see. It's a long Maltese. I just thought... Well, thank you, old friend, but it's nothing I cannot deal with. And I trust you were satisfied with how we brought Madame de Villefort's carriage down. It was, of course, expertly done. Not a scratch to man or beast. Mm. Still got a trick or two up my sleeve, don't I? We shall take a pipe of hashish together later, I hope. Certainly. Now, we'd best not delay the crime prosecutor any longer than we have to. Breathing softly. Oh, so very softly. Observe the Count as he looks into the mirror above the fire. And does not see in its brilliant reflection 
An exquisitely furnished room. Repeat it back to me, Dantes. All of it. But instead a dungeon, dark, and buried deep in the bowels... But I understand it, Abbey Faria. ...of the Chateau d'If. Repeat it. But what if you're wrong? What if they did not betray me? Then you're a fool, Edmund, and deserve to rot here. I say it. Fenon and Dongla betrayed me. Their motives? Fenon for Mercedes, for lust, and Dongla for my position on the Ferron. Good. You're learning at last. But still, de Villefort's reason for imprisoning me here is unclear. He was prosecutor for Marseille, a man of responsibility and trust. And let us analyze him again. But we have already analyzed them over and over and over. And we'll continue to do so until we have discovered the meaning behind his actions. Now, you say on the night of your arrest, you had a letter to deliver. Yes. A letter addressed to whom? To a General Noitier. Noitier, Noitier. Ah, think, Maria, think. Ah, of course. Oh, what, old friend? Don't you see, Dantes? What here is the key? The key to what? Your undoing. My undoing? Yes, Jacopo. Monsieur Gerard de Villefort, crime prosecutor. Thank you, Jacopo. That will be all. Count. Monsieur... Count of Monte Cristo. An honor, sir. Well, I thought it only right and proper that I, Gerard de Villefort, Crown Prosecutor of Paris, come to your house and formally thank you for the kindness you demonstrated my family in their hour of need. Monsieur de Villefort, the satisfaction of preserving the life of a child and not sundering that most sacred of bonds which exists between a mother and her son relieved you of any obligation to visit me today. You are too gracious. Then let us say no more about it. Geography. I'm sorry? Well, the maps on the wall there, is it an interest? I'm more interested in humanity. You're a philosopher? As you were a crown prosecutor. Now, tell me, please, is that a title worth having? I beg your pardon? Because for my part, I'm damned if I can see any kind of use for it. Well, they say you have travelled widely, Count. The East? Yes. And perhaps those cultures do not quite comprehend our subtle systems of French justice. They understand an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Ask Fernand de Morcerf. De Morcerf took his own life, and so escaped rightful prosecution. But in taking his own life, has not God's justice most surely been done? <sighs> You've not been in Paris long, have you, Count? Long enough. And in that room of shadow and silence, another room starts to appear to the Count. Dantes. They say your name is Dantes. That is correct, sir. A room not seen in over 25 years. And you were arrested when? Not one hour ago, at my marriage feast. A room in Marseille. Now, according to this document, you are apparently a fanatical Bonapartist, actively engaged in plans to return the disgraced Emperor back to power. I'm... what? Well, is that not why you have been denounced? Denounced? You sound surprised. It's true that I delivered a package to Elba on behalf of the captain of the Ferron, of which I am first mate. To Elba? And did you see Bonaparte? I did, sir, but only for an instant. And what was in this package? I've no idea. Well, you have an honest look about you, don't you? Because everything, in every particular, I say is true, sir. Well, now, think carefully before you answer this. Is there anything you have about your person which might incriminate you in any way? I have this letter, sir, addressed to one General Noitier. Repeat that name, please. Noitier? General Noitier? Are you acquainted with the gentleman, sir? Have you had any personal dealings with General Noitier? None whatsoever, until a week ago. I, I never even heard of him. Right. The letter, please. The devil. Sir? Have you opened this letter? Tampered with it in any way? No, sir. 
Would it surprise you to know that this letter proves that there is a very real plot to restore the traitor Napoleon as Emperor of France? What? Hmm? As well as timely warnings to those closely associated with the intrigue. It would, sir, completely. Oh. Here is what I am going to do for you, Dantes. First of all, I'm going to burn this letter. A letter you are going to forget you ever had in your possession, is that clear? It is forgotten already. And then I'm going to instruct the guards to take you to the Chateau d'If, where... The Chateau d'If? Where you will be held for your safety until I have discovered who has acted so mendaciously against you. <gasps> I shall get to the bottom of this, Monsieur Dantes. You have my solemn word on it. Sergeant. Sir. I'm finished with this prisoner. Very good, sir. You give my compliments to the governor of the Dief, and you tell him that in this regard, NATBT, he'll understand. NATBT. Very good, sir. Now, the sergeant here, he'll take good care of you. Thank you, monsieur. Thank you. We shall meet again under more pleasant circumstances, I hope. I hope so, too, sir. I hope so, too, sir. Perhaps I might offer you some refreshment, Monsieur de Villefort, some brandy? As the Count stares at the thin-drawn man who stands so censoriously before him, it seems inconceivable that he could ever have been so naive as to... Thank you, no. ...believe him. Then perhaps, as an officer of the law, you can help me with an abbreviation I came across some years ago in an old legal document. Yes, yes, gladly. Trust him. N-A-T... B-T. Ah, it was an informal code we used years ago. No action to be taken. It was generally used to signify men who were perceived to be dangerous political activists. Anti-monarchists. Bonapartists. Bonapartists, especially. Fanatics to a man, every one. Thank you. You have been most helpful. Am I to understand that you do have some interest in our judicial system, after all? Although I consider myself to be above all human law, yes. Above all law? <laughs> I'm not sure I'm quite with you. There are certain men whose personalities have been so fashioned by fate and destiny, men who accurately perceive the sacred truth of justice and answer only to the greatest and most magnificent judge of all. And who might that be? Why, God himself. And do you consider yourself to be such a man? I do. <laughs> I see. I see that it amuses you to make sport of me. Not by any means. Well, I thank you once again for the great service you did my wife and child, sir. It's been a most fascinating conversation. Good evening. There is one more thing I would ask your father... Yes. His name is Noitier, isn't it? General Noitier. May I ask why this is of interest? I heard he was a brave and noble commander. Your information is correct. For a Bonapartist. The somewhat misguided political views of my father are well documented. But you do not share them? And never have. Is that why you change your name? Is there something that you wish to share with me, Count? Only that I hope... You and your wife will do me the honour of visiting me at my country house. We shall await your invitation keenly, Count. And as the Crown Prosecutor stiffly bows his head... Monsieur. That same, once fearless, General Noitier, father to de Villefort, loyal supporter of the long-dead Emperor Napoleon, is being fed some cold soup. <laughs> It's no good you kicking up so, Father. Can't let you starve, can we? Yeah. And it's parsnip, your favourite. From a wooden spoon. No! <laughs> he who, as we know, most honoured friends... Stroke or no stroke, you're not above good manners, General. ...sits alone in a dusty attic. No! <laughs> Very well, then. We shall wait until Monsieur de Villefort returns from visiting the Count of Monte Cristo, and you can tell him why you have refused to eat. Christo. I just told you all about him. The man who saved young Edward and I from certain death. Do you not listen to a word I say? Verity. Your granddaughter is in her room. Tin. Some soup first. There it goes. Well done. And open. 
I must say, the house will certainly be quiet when Valentine is finally off our hands and married. Married? Yes, General, married. <coughs> to Franz Depigny, no less. Depigny? Such a well-connected family. Aristocratic. <coughs> oh, oh, monsieur! <coughs> Liar! Liar! I shall fetch your son, I shall. <laughs> Valentine! <laughs> Valentine! <laughs> and explain your disgusting behaviour to him. Secrets. <laughs> Paris is all about secrets. Valentine! Over here, my love. And in the quietest corner of De Villefort's somewhat gloomy garden, another... I have counted the hours. ...is to be discovered on either side of an old garden wall. If only I could hold you in my arms and kiss you. Don't say it, my love. Oh, then let me climb over. No, you mustn't. Listen, Maximilian. There is a terrible rumour. What rumour? I am to be engaged to Franz Depigny. Depigny? You know him. I do, and he's a fool. Valentine! There's my stepmother. You must go. I cannot bear it. Where are you, you silly girl? Go! Until tomorrow, my love. You are. Did you not hear me calling? I was just so much. In future, will you come when you are called for? It's no good you pulling faces, Father. Valentine is to be married to Franz Depigny, and there it is. Lawyer! Lawyer! What? Lawyer! A lawyer? Why? Disinherit! Disinherit who? Valentine! You would destroy your granddaughter's one opportunity for security and social advancement. Lawyer! Lawyer! The Depigny family have one of the oldest and most respected names in France, and weren't you and he allies? Lawyer! That's enough, Father! <laughs> now, your wishes regarding who inherits this family's wealth will, of course, be respected and honoured. Now, if you'll excuse me. Valentine! Valentine! <laughs> Come. You wanted to see me, Father? I did, Valentine. For some time now, your stepmother and I have considered your, your future happiness. Thank you, Father. And to that end... We've had the good fortune to engineer a match between yourself and the Depigny family. I see. Ah, I wanted to be the first to share this happy news with you. May I ask if you are resolved on pursuing this course of action? You may, and I am. Are you crying? No, Father. Oh, dear child. It is for the best, I promise you. Come. Have you told Valentine the good news, Gerard? I have. Is it not good news, Valentine? It is, I suppose. You suppose? You, you may go to your room, Valentine. Thank you, Father, stepmother. Straight to bed, mind. She's so willful. <laughs> you might be kinder, Eloise. Kinder? Well, the girl has a lot to adjust to. We should arrange a meeting with Monsieur Depigny just as soon as we can. Agreed. Perhaps after we have visited the Count of Monte Cristo at his new house in Otoy. At? He told me about it this afternoon. Apparently it's haunted. Sorry, his house where? Otoy. Rue de la Fontaine. Story goes that these two young lovers buried their baby in his garden and one can still hear its ghostly cries in the night. He told you this. What a remarkable character the Count is. Which number, Rue de la Fontaine? Which number? Yeah, which number? <laughs> well, that's oh, Why can't you just answer the question? 28. D didn't your late wife's parents have a house at that address? They did. Yes, they did. Are you all right, Gerard? 
look as though you've seen a ghost yourself. Oh, forgive me, Eloise. It's, it's been a long and difficult day. Are you sure you don't want me to call no, a doctor? I am positive, thank you. Thank you. Extraordinary, the coincidence, no? Extraordinary. <laughs> In The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas, adapted by Sebastian Bonchkevich, the Count is played by Ian Glenn, Ede by Jane Lapotere, the younger Ede, Amber Rose Reva, and Abbe Faria, Richard Johnson. Baron Donglar is Toby Jones, Hermine Donglar, Stephanie Racine, Fernand de Morcerf, Zubin Varla, and Mercedes de Morcerf, Josette Simon. Gérard de Villefort is Paul Rees, Eloise de Villefort, Kate Fleetwood, General Noirtier, Carl Johnson, Valentine, Lizzie Watts, and Albert, Will Howard. Jacopo is played by Joe Sims, Max Morel by Adam Nagaitis, and The Coachman by Paul Stonehouse. The music is by David Tobin and Jeff Megan, and the directors are Jeremy Mortimer and Sasha Yevtushenko. Tomorrow at the same time, the Count of Monte Cristo tightens his grip on Baron d'Anglars and the Crown Prosecutor, while unearthing a scandal that links two of his remaining enemies. Alec Baldwin's podcast series, Here's the Thing, has returned to Radio 4 Extra. A second edition in this series is a poignant interview from 2014, when he sat down with his fellow star of the big screen, Debbie Reynolds. Debbie worked in show business for over six decades before her death in 2016. Alec and Debbie talked intimately about her life in Hollywood, including her relationship with the director Henry Hathaway and her daughter Carrie Fisher. I really loved all the directors. I loved Hathaway too. I, I became very dear friends and visited you together. You are an Aries, aren't you? You're an Aries. And I'm not big on astrology, but people who are Aries, they always say they love to bury the hatchet and have people get along. Yes. And even though you can have a bad temper and you can have grudges against people, they don't last. No, you just speak up. Right. You're kind of rigorously honest, if we, if you will. But for you, you buried the hatchet with Hathaway and he became a friend. You're someone that doesn't like to hold a grudge with people. No, I don't, but I'm rather like an elephant. I, I, I remember everything. Yeah. Alec Baldwin speaks to Debbie Reynolds in Here's the Thing on BBC Radio 4 Extra on Thursday morning at 11 and again in the evening at 9. This is BBC Radio 4 Extra. It's 11 and this is David. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Adapted by Sebastian Bonchkevich Part 3 Wednesday, most honoured friends <coughs> A fire on my hand! You're standing on my hand! Benedetto Benedetti who wants to know? Is your name Benedetto Benedetti? Yes, yes! Now, Benedetto Benedetti, may I assume I have your full attention? The world turns on a Wednesday. Yes, yes, monsieur, completely. A Wednesday in Marseille. And this is your lucky day. Who... Who are you? I'm the person who's about to change your life. What? You are to present yourself at this address in Paris, exactly one week from today. You understand? Paris! Do you understand? Yes, yes! Just please, take your foot off my hand. Another cup of tea, Monsieur Jacopo? And a Wednesday in Paris. Thank you. Now, what was it that you were asking? One week later. I believe you were a midwife, Madame Lasselle. In a house, in Otoy, number 28, Rue de la Fontaine. Uh, no, monsieur, I was a housekeeper, nothing more. But you 
did serve at that address 20 years ago, did you not? I did, yes. Then you will recall, I'm sure, the young couple who turned up there one night in some distress. The house was empty. There was a storm, wind and rain. Terrible business. No, I, I can't say that the I... The young didn't... man was Gerard de Villefort, Crown Prosecutor of Paris. Please, Monsieur, I have sworn, solemnly sworn, never to speak Do of... Do sit down, madame. And she was... Now, there's the thing. Who was she? There was a gardener at Otoy, Bertuccio. His name was Bertuccio. He can tell you better than I. Find Bertuccio. Bertuccio did not deliver a baby that night. Now, please, Madame Lassalle, be good enough to open that bag. What are these? Diamonds. Diamonds? Worth just over 200,000 francs. A sum which would keep a poor widow such as yourself comfortable until the very end of her days, as well as securing a future for all five of her grandchildren. But if the Crown Prosecutor should suspect that I... Here you will never find you, madame. The man I work for will provide you with a new home down south. Somewhere warm. Montpellier is very nice, I hear. Now, her name. <laughs> Radishes, my friend. I grow radishes and lettuces. Them lettuces won a prize last year. Mmm, delicious. Absolutely delicious. <sighs> Told you, didn't I? You must find this job of yours uh, occasionally a little uh, tedious. <laughs> tedious? I can wait days for a new message to be telegraphed, but you can't ever relax, not for an instant. Because you must keep your eye on the telegraph post yonder. Mm. Just as Jack on the next hill keeps his eye on me. Ah, if it weren't for my garden, I don't know what I'd do. And the pay for such a responsible job is... Oh, not worth mentioning, my friend. An insult. And we may recognise, most honoured friends, this gentleman, who now shields his eyes from the perpetual glare of that bright, unforgiving sun. And if a person were to appear one day and offer you, uh, I don't know, 60,000 francs? <laughs> 60,000 francs? <laughs> As the Count of Monte Cristo. And if that person were to request that an unofficial message be conveyed... Uh, then I'd tell that person that he was talking to the wrong man, my friend. It's true that the telegraph operator would be dismissed for permitting such a message to be sent, but then he would have 100,000 francs to retire on. Only today he is attired humbly, as befits a man keen to learn all he can about an elderly telegraph operator's kitchen garden. There's more than enough there to see you and your wife happy and content until the end of your days. And the telegraph company? You would have to underpay a new operator. Who are you, my friend? Who I am is of no importance. And this message would be... What exactly? Baron Dongla! Baron Dongla! Baron Dongla! Baron Dongla what, Michelle? War. Sorry? There is war with Spain. It was just announced on the telegraph. Am I the first to know? You are, sir. The information has not yet reached the bourse. Not as far as I'm aware. Then I want you to buy war bonds. Three million francs worth. Three million? Yes, Michelle. Three million. Won't that attract attention? Not as much attention as we'll have when we're selling those same war bonds at four or five hundred times what we paid for them. Nothing says profitable return quite like an international skirmish. Eh, Michel? And as Baron Dongla, he who, as we well know, along with his accomplice Fernand, falsely denounced the young sailor Edmond Dantes in the old port of Marseille, now, you're clear about what will happen as soon as this letter is delivered. The consequences. Dotes will be arrested. 
Dongla. Twenty-five long years before. Dantes will be arrested and more than likely thrown in jail for treason. Then that will be an end to him. And nobody must ever know. Risks more than half his fortune on an apparent war with Spain. Valentine? Valentine? Two lovers meet clandestinely on either side of a shabby wall at the shadowed end of a garden off the Champs-Élysées. Hey, Maximilian. Oh, that I could hold you in these arms for just one second, my love. Don't say that. Please, not today. What's happened? Valentine de Villefort is just as beautiful today as she was when we first met her. The worst has happened. I don't even know how to say this, Maximilian. Say what? That tomorrow I am to be... To be formally engaged to France d'Avigny. So soon? My grandfather has disinherited me as a consequence. Disinherited you? God forgive me, but I even got down on my knees and prayed that France would get called upon to serve in this war with Spain. What war with Spain? Everyone in Paris is speaking of it. There is no war with Spain. I have just arrived from Marseille. Then we are lost, my love. <laughs> you can imagine my unimaginable and fountainous surprise on hearing the news, my dear Count. But let us now, most honoured friends, consider a little more closely the perilously thin young man we last saw being chased down an alley in Marseille. I am very pleased to see you, Andrea. A man who is now draped inelegantly, draped across an antique chaise long, smoking an almost equally thin black cigarette. To think that I... Benedetto Benedetti, a poor boy from the slums of Marseille, is actually related. <laughs> actually related by blood to the cavalcantes of Padua. <laughs> An impossible dream come true. From now on, you will not be known as Benedetto Benedetti. No, Count. No. I shall be known as Andrea. Andrea Cavalcanti. Your man made that very clear. I've had an apartment prepared, and you shall receive a generous weekly income as befits a young man of means and expectation. Uh, an income? Is that not acceptable? Well, I understood there was to be uh, an inheritance of some description. As I am your legal guardian, you may rest assured that you will receive all that I have led you to expect and more, but you will receive it at my discretion. Now, if these are not terms that you can accept... Uh, then... I am at your disposal. Sir. Excellent. Then tonight you can meet the parents of the girl I have arranged for you to marry. To... Sorry? Her father's a business associate of mine, Baron Donglam. <gasps> of, of the banking house? Tonight at my house, no toy. We will all dine together. I trust that this is acceptable. Oh, perfectly so. Perfectly so, my dear Count. Thank you. However, a word of warning, Andrea. And for a moment, there is a chill in that faultlessly furnished apartment on the Champs-Élysées. Yes, Count? A chill which zigzags its way from the tips of Andrea Cavalcanti's toes to the curled ends of his recently coiffed hair. Never think to betray me. Well, of course not, no. Never, never. No. Jacopo will show you out. Thank you. Thank you. Signor Cavalcanti is leaving. This way, sir. Until tonight, dear Count. But now a summer storm hurls lightning across that grey, unsuspecting Parisian sky, sending its citizens scuttling. Must say, that's a fine-looking coat you've got there. Into densely shadowed oh. doorways. Thank you. What? The hurry, citizen. Please take your hand off my shoulder, sir. Have I changed so very much, Benedetto? I beg your pardon? Easy to forget, I know. The lock-up in too long. The one-armed guard relieving himself twice daily through the bars of our cell. Oh, no. Ah, at last. A light. I, I meant to come back for you. I did. And I believe you, Benedetto. I believe you. What do you want, Cadrus? Cadrus? One? Yes. 
Well, why, we haven't met this gentleman before, have we not? I don't want anything from you but the pleasure of your company tomorrow afternoon. When he was the proprietor of a broken-down inn with a rusty sign. Tomorrow afternoon. On the dusty road outside Marseille. Shall we say around three? Where he murdered his wife. Don't look so nervous, Benedetto. For a glittering diamond. A diamond he received in payment for telling an old priest by the name of Busoni the exact circumstances which led to the betrayal and denunciation... I don't do the thieving anymore, Caderousse. ...of one Edmond Dantes. I turned my back on all that. I gave it up. You're an honest man now. Exactly. The address is on this paper, Benedetto Benedetti. Now don't be late. Or I might be compelled to let slip a nasty rumour to the owner of that smart-looking townhouse. The Count of Monte Cristo, is it? Ciao. Oh, and as the sky is clear and the sun dips westward, bathing the streets of Paris in a wash of blinding light, whoa there. Whoa, whoa. a carriage pulls up. Is this the Count of Monte Cristo's carriage? Send with his compliments, Monsieur de Villefort. You are Monsieur de Villefort, aren't you? I am. De Villefort. Recognised you for when you came to visit the count the other week, didn't I, sir? And where are we going exactly? He, who you will recall, most honoured friends, some 25 years before, falsely imprisoned the first mate of the Faron, one Edmond Dantes, solely because he had about his person a letter addressed to De Villefort's father, the notorious Bonapartist General Noirtier. Going, sir? Yes, man. Going. A letter which would have exposed his father's part in returning the disgraced Emperor Napoleon back to sovereignty. Why? To visit the Count of Monte Cristo? A letter discovered in the hands of a recently denounced young sailor named Edmond Dantes. Will your wife be joining us, sir? Yes. Yes, she will. Now the address. A young sailor whom de Villefort casually condemns, without charge or trial, to a life of torment in the hell of the Chateau d'If, solely in order to protect that same de Villefort's favoured name and hard-won reputation as a loyal and devoted servant of the king. The address is number 28, Rue de la Fontaine, Auteuil. And there is no mistake. He who disguises his essential poverty of spirit behind the unflinching mask of law. Sorry? He who, along with the banker Baron Danglars, awaits to experience the wrath and divinely inspired justice. Is that our courage, Gerard? Of the Count of Monte Cristo. Permit me to open the door for you, madame. Monsieur? You're too kind, too kind. Perhaps you should go on your own tonight, my dear. I... Oh, my own. Well, I have papers, papers for the court tomorrow. Get in the carriage, Gerard. I beg your pardon. If you think that I am going to miss an opportunity to dine with the Count of Monte Cristo, then you are very gravely mistaken, monsieur. But... But what? You think today has been easy for me? Valentine in tears in her room, Edouard distressed and listless, the lawyers arrive. I know that today has been challenging. Challenging? Is that what you call it? Challenging. Your father intends to disinherit your daughter. Ruin her. Please, Eloise. Because I could think of a number of names for it, and challenging is not one of them. Must we really make a scene oh, on the street? It's quite at an end. And it's not as if your father will ever instruct those wretched lawyers of his to disinherit Valentine and pass his estate on to our Edouard instead. Oh, no. Your son barely warrants a passing thought, does he? And why has the obscenely wealthy General Noitier decided to do all this? Eloise, please. Why has he decided to ruin your daughter's one, her only, in fact, chance of social advancement? Not her only. Because of some idiotic political argument he had with the more than respectable France d'Epinay's father 25 years ago. Well, no, Gerard, no. We are going to the Count of Monte Cristo and we are going to attempt to have a pleasant evening because I do not think my poor nerves can take much more of a battering now. Please get in the carriage and let us be on our way. And as he reluctantly joins his wife, Eloise, in the Count's carriage and as Jacopo cracks the whip and the wheels clatter across the cobbles... Yeah! 
The Crown Prosecutor of Paris looks up at the attic window of his father's room, upon which the dying sun now savagely reflects itself on this bright and unseasonably warm evening in early June. Are we to sit in silence all the way, Don While in another coach, perched on the edge of their exquisitely upholstered seats, the Donglar, Hermine and her husband, the Baron himself, who sits at this moment with his fist at his chin as he stares without seeing at all the bright and lively boulevards they pass on their way. A false war. To Auteuil. I've never heard of anyone falsifying a war. What are you talking about, Donglar? This fabricated war with Spain. It's nothing to get so agitated about. Is it not? Certain gentlemen have lost fortunes buying war bonds today. Fortunes. What certain? Oh, no. You know what? How much have we lost? I'd sooner not discuss it. How much? I said I would sooner not discuss it. Oh, for God's sake, Don Glass. Finished. Over. Thank you. Where exactly are we going anyway? To the Count's house at Otoy. Told you. Yes, but where? The address? Number 28, Rue de la Fontaine. Rue de la Fontaine? You familiar with it? Of course not. No. But let us observe, most honoured friends, her face as she peers out into the fast approaching night and perceive in the paleness of her cheek and the glimpse of panic in her eye. I am grateful to you, Count for receiving me at such short notice. Fear. A pleasure to see you again, Monsieur Morel. I come to you with news from Marseille. Marseille? Madame Mercedes de Morcerf sends her compliments, Monsieur. Well, they are gratefully received. Is Madame de Morcerf in good health? As well as can be expected after her recent ordeal. Commander de Morcerf's public disgrace and suicide has cost mother and son most dearly. And you, Maximilian, how are you? I am... You are? I am... Well, forgive me. <clears throat> then something is wrong. Madame de Morcerf asked me to give you this. And gently, oh, so very gently, the young officer passes over an exquisitely fashioned rose oh. of blood-red glass. Madame de Morcerf asked me to deliver this as a token of her appreciation for all that you did for her. Now, with your permission, I will not detain you any longer. I hope you have a most pleasant evening. Anything I can ever do for you, Maximilian. Sir. And as the young man retreats across that shadowy garden, the Count is for a moment transported. Oh, it's beautiful, Edmund. To a quiet quayside in Marseille on a glorious summer day. You like it, Mercedes? 25 years before. Where on earth did you find such a wonderful thing? A small shop in Naples. The owner designs them himself. <gasps> when we are in our house, I shall keep it where everyone can see it. Our house? The house you and I will live in together. Oh, oh that house. <laughs> I'd almost forgotten. With all our children. All our children? How many do we have? Three or four? It depends. On what? The size of our garden. Oh, of course. <laughs> How foolish. Oh, and we will grow old in that garden. We'll be like... Oh, we'll be like two old deers holding hands. The sun setting behind us. Oh... I think that I will love you forever, Edmund. And I you, Mercedes. I you. Nothing will ever tear us apart, will it? Nothing. Have you a moment, my dear Count? Monsieur Cavalcanti. I, uh, I had a new suit made in honour of tonight's proceedings. See? What a lovely rose. As great candles are daintily lit, I see Monsieur Favreau has brought all his tailoring skills to bear as usual. Their shadows suggesting the broken movements of monsters on that exquisitely manicured lawn. Is it to your taste? I prefer my clothes to blend in with their surroundings. Oh, then you do not like it? Are the cuffs perhaps too 
lively. Uh, the green. Too... too green? My opinion of your suit is of no importance. It is Baron Donglar and his wife that you must impress tonight. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, of course. Now, as soon as I've introduced you to the Baron and the Baroness, I would like you to return to Paris. Return to... Am I not to dine with you? Is that understood? Monsieur! Yes, Jacobo. The Crown Prosecutor and Madame de Villefort have arrived. Excellent. And the Dongla are here also. <laughs> I must say, Monsieur Cavalcanti, that is a very lively and stylish suit you're wearing. Do you not like the tailoring, Baron? I didn't say that, my boy. Well, I did not. Not in any way. Oh, then may I salvage some reassurance from your recent utterance? You may. You may indeed, young man. Uh, unfortunately, I, I'm not going to be able to join you at dinner this evening. Not join us? I must return to Paris on the Count's business. Is it to do with this phony Spanish war? Phony? But I'm not sure that I take oh, your meaning. I spoke in haste. <laughs> Please. Banish it from your mind, my dear boy. Ah, dinner is announced and I oh. must away. Away. Oh, oh uh, uh, take my card, uh, Monsieur Cavalcanti. Oh. Uh, present yourself at the address there tomorrow and uh, we shall arrange a formal meeting between Mademoiselle Dongla and your good self. Oh. I shall live from this moment on only for that moment, Baron. <laughs> What on earth is the matter with you tonight, Gerard? There is Gerard? nothing of the matter. Is it Valentine? Yes. Is yes. it she you are still concerned about? Yes, yes it is. And then it's nothing to do with coming to Otoy? Of course not. Not at all. No, why would it be? If only we could talk some sense into that father of yours. Well, General Noitier's mind is not to be changed once made up. As well you know, Eloise. But what was the nature of this political dispute he had with the Depignies anyway? I don't know. You don't? I thought your father and Depinay were both comrades and allies of Bonaparte. Both gentlemen were politically misguided. Yeah. Is this why you're so reluctant to discuss it? Because of your father's ancient political sympathies? Honestly, Gerard. I said I don't know, Eloise. Now, please, can we... Well, what I do know, for a fact, is that France Depinay is to meet Valentine tomorrow morning at 11, be she disinherited or no. I think the guests may be gathering and right there. there. In our drawing room, the pair of them will be formally engaged to be married. Ladies and gentlemen, the Count politely requests you to take your places at the table. And try a cavalcanti as I live and breathe. On a fashionable street corner just off the Champs Elysees, a young man in a peacock green suit strides confidently toward the front door of his new apartment. Cadros? Why I see it? Why wait for tomorrow? Yeah, but yes, but I'd... what? Now, let's go inside. As I've little desire to speak my business on a street corner, no matter how select. I trust that the veal is to your satisfaction, Baron Dongler. Mm. Oh, the veal is delicious, and these these quail legs, divine, quite divine. But something troubles you. Uh, may I depend on your discretion? At all times. This business with Spain, this war that never was... It proves once again that we cannot depend on the accuracy of the telegraph. Indeed, indeed. We set such store in these technologies, do we not? But only one thing needs to go awry and... Pfft. Now, tell me, what has happened? I'm all but ruined, my dear Count. Black Wednesday, they're calling it. Ruined. I invested heavily in war bonds. Half my fortune. Gone. Like that. Heavens. Who in their right mind would maliciously start a rumour that we were on the verge of hostilities with a neighbouring power? Who indeed? Such a person would have to be criminally perverse. Of course, as soon as Andrea is married to your daughter... Who? You, uh, Eugenie. Eugenie. You shall receive double that sum as a mark of the trust and good faith that exists between our two families. Double. I hope young Andrea Cavalcanti has made a favourable impression this evening. Oh, 
Rarely has a young man made one finer count. You didn't think his suit too loud? Oh, I, I thought the green sublime and in the best possible taste. I'm even thinking of instructing my tailor to make one exactly the same for me. Then it might be said that you and young Andrea were as peas in a pod. Huh? What are you two gentlemen whispering about up there? Uh, nothing of any import, Madame de Villefort. Mm. I trust that you are enjoying your meal. Oh, it's divine. Mm. It's just divine. Isn't it divine, Gerard? It's, yes, it's very uh, uh, tasty. And is everything to your satisfaction, Baroness Dongla? Mm. Sorry? Oh. The meal. Oh, it's lovely. Exquisite. Sorry. Um, sorry. And with the most surreptitious of glances across the table, de Villefort considers the still ravishing Hermine Danglars, who is at this very moment staring, and staring somewhat disconsolately into her saffron-infused bisque. Mm. Now, do tell, Count. A tell what, Madame de Villefort? That story you told me. The lovers in the garden. It was here that they met, wasn't it? In this very garden. <coughs> you all right, Monsieur de Villefort? Yes, it's, uh, sorry, it's nothing. <coughs> it's really nothing. Uh, are you sure? <coughs> Gerard. Uh, fetch Monsieur de Villefort some water. <coughs> water. Oh. Excuse me. If it's money you want, Cadros. Of course I... it's money I want. Why else would I be here in these very, very nice apartments, Andrea? Fair play to you. How much? Well, given your present circumstances, shall we say a thousand a month? <laughs> After all, I only want enough to wet me beak. Thousand francs? To start with, yes. Although I do get awful thirsty. The Count of Monte Cristo will... will find out. Well, not if you don't tell him, he won't. And you won't tell him. Because we share the same thought, you and I. I see it in those papers of yours, clear as the Virgin's lonely tears. Now, Andrea, you tell your Uncle Cadrus everything. He has money scattered everywhere. And diamonds. He has diamonds everywhere. What do you mean, everywhere? I, I mean, everywhere. He leaves them lying about like, like toffees. Then what do you say we enter into a partnership of some kind? Only if we go off. 50-50. Done. And Monte Cristo is dangerous. I am dangerous. <laughs> not like him, you're not. Well, then we must be extra, extra careful, mustn't we? Now fetch us over that pen and paper, Benedetto, because I'd like you to draw me a little picture. If you are quite sure that you do not want a little more water, Monsieur de Villefort. Oh, thank you. No. Perhaps it's the heat. Yes. Uh, the heat, perhaps, yes, perhaps. It is a little close tonight, isn't it? Is it, Madame Donglin? One would have thought after the rain earlier that... That... Um, that? That the air would be cooler, less... Oppressive. Precisely. Then you are not enjoying the evening. Oh, far from it, dear Count. The evening is... is second to none. Oh, you do me too much honour, Madame. Monsieur de Villefort and I are having a wonderful evening also, aren't we, Gerard? It's, yes, it's... Most diverting, Count. Now, what was it you were about to say earlier, Madame de Villefort? I was only mentioning in passing that rather grim story you told me. Ah, yes. Story? What, what story? Well, perhaps you would like to enlighten us, Madame de Villefort. Uh, well, Count, thank you again for a very pleasant evening, but unfortunately I think my wife and I should be oh, do heading away. Oh, sit down, Gerard. Now... If I might continue without further interruption. Please, madame. Oh, very well. There were two lovers. He, a young widower. She, a young heiress. And they would secretly meet here in this very garden. Here? Under those very elms. Imagine. Is that it? Uh, no. No, far from it. You see... The young heiress fell pregnant. Of course, neither party could afford the ensuing scandal, and so, well... Oh, Count, you had best continue. And now, as that tight summer dark enshrouds itself about the table, the Count begins. And so the story goes. On the night of the infant's birth, 
the panic-stricken father hurries into the garden with the newborn folded in a pale pink blanket. Ignore him, as if he does not recognize the glance of alarm and fathomless terror which now passes between Hermine d'Anglars and Crown Prosecutor Gérard de Villefort. Determined to rid himself of this child. No. Yes, Baron, yes. Glancing this way and that to see that he is unobserved, the man quickly takes a spade and starts to dig a hole. Stop, Count, please. It's too horrible. A hole which has to be dug deep enough to ensure that all trace of that unloved and unwanted baby is erased from this world forever. Ma, ma, must we continue with this disgusting <laughs> story? I really don't... A hole in which he now buries that helpless, innocent, alive. Oh! What? What is it? I mean, speak to me. Jacopo, send for a doctor immediately. Have the carriages prepared to take our guests home. But let us leave that torch-lit garden in Otoe and watch, now as once again, that bright summer sun rises over the house. I know that you do not wish to see me, Grandfather, but I will not allow you to cast me out. Away. Of de Villefort. Go. I will not go. For I am just as stubborn as you, and I will give you this. Mwah! As Valentine seeks solace in the company of her grandfather. <laughs> oh, this engagement to Franz Depigny is not of my doing. I don't know what you may have heard, but I have had no part in it. Him, love. Of course not. I swear. I swear to you that I have not even met, let alone know that gentleman. You didn't imagine that I would fall in love with a Depigny, did you? Disinherit! What do I care if you have disinherited me, Grandfather? You'll never kill the love and affection I have for you. Never. So do your worst, stroke or no stroke. <laughs> Valentine. Oh. Valentine. Oh, do not cry, Grandfather, please. Let us reacquaint ourselves with a man you will remember, most honoured friends, as the father of Gérard de Villefort. Damn. Lovely. Lovely. <laughs> the redoubtable Bonapartist and timeless thorn in the side of his dutiful son's political ambitions. You are the only person in this house I can honestly open my heart to, Grandfather. General Child. Jacques Noirtier. And you must know... That my heart will always belong to another, no matter how many suitors my father and stepmother supply for me. No, no. I have wanted to tell you about him for so long. He is an officer in the army. Oh, love? I love him with all my heart, Grandfather. <laughs> with all my heart. See? Now I am weeping also. <laughs> Out! What? Out! Stairs! Down! But... Friends, Stepigny will be arriving to formalise the engagement within the hour. Stairs! Down! Oh. Stairs! Down! You buried the child alive? Did anybody see you arrive at the office? Answer the question, Gerard, because last night was without question the worst of my life. What choice did I have? Oh, sweet hmm? Jesus, forgive us. Oh. I mean. You said you gave the baby away. You swore well, I didn't, to me. Well, I didn't want to. I to, uh, to burden you. Burden me. Burden me. Please, Amy. Please. We must not draw attention to ourselves. Anybody How could come in. How can this anybody. be happening to us? Last night was as much an ordeal for me as for you. You murdered our baby, Sharon. No. Yes. Does that not concern you? Well, of course it concerns me. Oh, God. Oh, God, I think I'm going out of my mind. Who is this Count of Monte Cristo? Nobody knows. He's materialised out of thin air. But you were the Crown Prosecutor. Have some inquiries made. I have done that. I, I've already done that. And? Well, there is a gentleman currently residing in Paris who has had some prior dealings with him. One Abbe Busoni. And have you approached him? I shall be calling on him this morning. Now, please... I mean, we will be all right. I promise. Hold me. Yes. I need you to hold me. Yes. Oh. 
our lives might have been different if we had only. Oh, don't, I mean. Please, please. Monsieur! Is that your wife? The side door. Quickly. You will visit that gentleman today, won't you? Yes, yes, yes. Now, please. Please. Come. Oh, Gerard. I'm so sorry to disturb you. Eloise. It's a catastrophe. A catastrophe. Whatever's happened. Your father has disgraced us all. Monsieur Cavalcanti, what a delightful surprise. If I have come at an inconvenient time to your office... Uh, you could never inconvenience me, my dear, dear fellow. Never! Why, it's as if you're already a part of the family. You do me too much honour, sir. Won't you join us in the garden? We were just taking tea. This way. Just so that I can be clear in my mind, let us go over it again. Monsieur Depinier came to the house to formalise the engagement as was arranged. Yes. yes. And you were waiting for him, Valentine? Yes, Father. General Noitier also. Insist. You insisted, did you, Father? Marriage. Stop. Oh, yes, General. You stopped it all right. Stopped it for good. Dishonoured us and dishonoured the good name of Depinier. Thank you, Eloise. Not Just... enough that all the enormous wealth of this family is in the name of Noitier. Oh, no. You must hold your own grandchildren to ransom. I said enough. Now, Valentine, if you would. Monsieur Depinier stood by the fireplace, and before he could make his formal proposal, Grandfather produced this letter and asked me to read it. I should never have permitted it. Never. May I have the letter? Of course. It is dated February 1815. And it is from Franz Depinier's father, Colonel Depinier. He has even signed it, see? No, no, no. There's some mistake. Mistake? No. Traitor! Digny! Well, Colonel Depigny was a royalist double agent. Yes. Your old comrade smuggled this letter to you. Yes. And it goes on to detail how Colonel Depigny tortured Grandfather and caused his... his... And caused his stroke. Oh, no. No. And your father has kept that wretched letter... Locked away all these years, just waiting for the moment to spring it on us unawares. For shame, old man, for shame! <laughs> you are not improving the situation, Eloise. But there is still more bad news contained within this I letter. I think your father has heard enough for one day, Valentine. Which is? Apparently, according to what is written here, Colonel Depigny discovered he had an advantage over Grandfather when Grandfather failed to receive a warning which would have exposed Colonel Depigny's villainy. A warning sent via the trading ship the Faron, um, which must have been intercepted and destroyed by the authorities in Marseille. Destroyed by the authorities? Yes, Father. And at that moment, the Crown Prosecutor is transported... I have this letter, sir, addressed to one General Moitier. To his old office in Marseille, and a young, long forgotten sailor denounced for treason. Have you opened this letter? Tampered with it in any way? No, sir. Twenty five long years before. Then you have no idea of the contents contained herein. I need not remind you of the dire consequences facing you if you lie. I do not, sir. Would it surprise you to know that this letter proves that there is a very real plot to restore the traitor Napoleon as Emperor of France? As well as timely warnings to those closely associated with the intrigue? It would, sir. Completely. Now, here is what I'm going to do for you. First of all, I'm going to burn this letter. A letter you are going to forget you ever had in your possession. Is that clear? If Grandfather had only received that letter, then all his terrible suffering might have been avoided. And with a jolt, the Crown Prosecutor of Paris is once again confronted by the innocent, insistent gaze of his daughter. Whatever may be written here is no proof that any other letter was ever sent for or indeed ever existed. Valentine. Then why is it clearly referred to here? Well, all that we can know for sure 
is that the marriage between you and Franz Depenier cannot proceed under these circumstances. This is why we are dishonoured, Monsieur, quite dishonoured. And for de Villefort, it is as if a thousand bees are suddenly... Now, I'm sorry, but there is some urgent business I must attend to immediately. Excuse me. Swarming. You're not leaving. We shall discuss this further this evening. Hmm? Justice. Done. I'm sorry, Father, sincerely, for any suffering you may have endured at the hands of Colonel Depinier. It was and remains entirely unacceptable. Good day. Well, I hope you're pleased with yourself, old man, because you have not only disinherited Valentine from her dowry, you have also just guaranteed that nobody in polite society will ever marry her. Inherit? It's a bit late to re-inherit her now. Edward. What did you say? Do you intend to rewrite your will? Inherit. Both. Both? If this is one of your tricks, General. Liar. Liar. I think Grandfather is serious. So what are you waiting for, girl? Go! Oh. And send the footman to fetch a lawyer! And hurry! I cannot tell you what a pleasure it is to make your acquaintance at last, Monsieur Cavalcanti. The pleasure is all mine, Baroness Danglars. All mine. <laughs> and may I say, your garden is exquisite. <sighs> Why, it almost surpasses the Count of Monte Cristo's at Otoy. Yes. Well, uh, that may be true, Monsieur. That may very well be true. But I can assure you there is no rose in the Count's garden as precious as the one you see... Sitting in the arbor, yonder? Oh. Can this vision be Mademoiselle Danglars herself? Eugenie? Yes, mother? There's a young gentleman here your father and I would like to introduce you to. So, Monsieur Cavalcanti, what instrument do you play? Oh, music has not, to date, played the part in my life I had hoped, Mademoiselle Danglars. Or... May I call you Eugenie? But has not the Count of Monte Cristo seen to your education? Oh, the, the Count and I were separated for many, many years. I was a lost babe in the wood, so to speak. And the tattoo on your wrist? Most unusual. <laughs> ah, uh, a childish prank. Done to resemble a prison number. A, a prison number? <laughs> the very idea. Well, Monsieur Cavalcanti, it has been a very... Enlightening afternoon. <laughs> Must you leave so soon? My teacher, Mademoiselle Damilly, awaits me. Oh. A charming young lady, if I may say so. No, you may not say, monsieur. Forgive me, Mademoiselle Danglars, but are you and the young lady especially, uh, how shall we say, close? What an impertinent question. You see, I have observed that look in only a few of my female acquaintances. And what look would that be? Oh, I think you know it very well. Is, uh, is everything all right over there, Eugenie? <laughs> everything is lovely, Father. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I cannot imagine which class of boulder my father lifted to discover you, Monsieur Cavalcanti. <laughs> but rest assured, I shall never agree to marry you. <laughs> oh. And there, dear Eugenie, is where you are very wrong. For I believe the Count and Baron Danglars have already, to coin a vulgar phrase, closed the deal. Abbe Busoni. But let us turn, most honoured friends, to Monsieur de Villefort and his somewhat impromptu visit to the house of Abbe Busoni, which just so happens to be located next door to his own. At your service, Monsieur de Villefort. Well, I shall come straight to the point, if I may. Please. The Count of Monte Cristo. A man struggling with his conscience. Why? What has he done? What has he not done? Not done? If only he would give more to the poor children of Paris. But he says he does what he can and can do no more. And of course you are quite correct, most honored friends. We have met this Abbe Busoni before and detected in his somewhat grizzled stare 
the unmistakable eyes of one... Then he is mean? Count of Monte Cristo. On the contrary, he is generosity itself, but generosity, according to him, must have its limits. But you trust him? With my life. Oh, thank you, Abbe Busoni. Thank you. You seem burdened with woes, my son. Pray with me. Oh, I would like that, but I must... Ah, oh, well, uh, monsieur, another time. Hmm? Excuse me. Still, it is not as if you have far to go, is it? <laughs> we shall see each other again, I hope. You may depend upon it. Kedros. You light. I had a prior engagement. With the Count? With my fiancée. But the Count and all his entourage is definitely in Paris today. Definitely. You're certain? Aren't you going to congratulate me? Congratulations. Now, to the best of your knowledge, no toy house is completely empty. Gone deaf, have we? Mess this up and I'll slit your throat, Benedetto. Yeah, mess this up and it's both our throats. Now get climbing. The ivy's coming off and you're... Go! Monsieur de Villefort, how very glad we are to see you. Isn't that right, Hermine? Uh, you are most welcome, sir. I trust that you have fully recovered from last night, madame. I said no! Oh. Uh, perhaps you had best see what's wrong, husband. Yes, uh, perhaps I should, if you will excuse me, monsieur. Well? I spoke to Abbe Busoni. And? Well, he has assured me that apart from some mild eccentricities, the Count of Monte Cristo is quite benign. <sighs> now, the best thing we can do is to forget all about last night. Behaving like a horrible prima donna, you I see that I've come at a most inconvenient time. I shall never forgive you for what you did, Gerard. And now, in an apparently empty house in Otoe, a window splinters, and an intruder clambers cautiously into a normally airy room. Darkened now. Unfortunately, I have no diamonds for you tonight, my son. The shadow. Abby Bussoni! You're a little thinner, perhaps, Cadrus, but otherwise hardly changed in one. Ten years. This is not possible. I assume that you were intending to rob the Count of Monte Cristo. How could you have known? Well, was it Benedetto I told you, was it? Benedetto? Yeah, because he's not what he seems, that one. I mean, you can take the man out of the sewer, but you, you can't take the sewer out of the man, if you know what I mean. All too well. But why did you come to Paris if not to seek young Benedetto out? I, I never sought him out. I assume that you plan to extort him. How much? Don't know what you're talking about. Come, come, Cadrus. No need for coyness. You're in enough trouble as it is. A thousand francs. But that was clearly not enough. Just as a diamond worth 50,000 francs was not enough, was it? Look... Why well, don't I just go back the way I came and we forget that this Quite ever... the coincidence. Two old cellmates from Toulon running into one another. Most fortuitous. How can you know all this? The Count of Monte Cristo has told me everything. And now, I'm afraid I shall have to tell Baron Dongla that the young man to whom he has just engaged his daughter is in league with a notorious thief. By the devil! Take this! Oh, 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 oh. No! Oh. Perhaps your knife is a little blunt, monsieur. Mm. Are you listening, Catrus? You're breaking me arm. What is this you have in your hand? Is it a plan of the house? You're Benedetto, Juliet. Come, come over here. Stop, stop, stop. I'm begging you, please. You see the pen and paper there? What about them? There's a little note I want you to write. <laughs> kind of a note. After you have done that, you are indeed going to climb out of that window, leave Paris immediately, and swear to live the life of an honest man. If you do this, then you will receive a generous salary from the Count of Monte Cristo until the end of your days. Are we clear? Oh, we're clear, we're clear. Good. Uh, uh, 
Now write. <laughs> Is it not the most wonderful news, Gerard? It is. In the house of de Villefort this evening... Yes, it is. There is a sense of uneasy celebration. Your father is to leave his fortune to both Valentine and Edouard. We shall send the boy to thank him tomorrow. Mm. Perhaps it was for the best, after all. This business with the Depignes. Although, who will want poor Valentine now? Valentine is not responsible for any of this. But mud state Not to the de Villefort's. Oh, to think that our own dear, sweet, wonderful boy will never have to worry about money again. Imagine, heir to his grandfather's inestimable fortune. Along with Valentine? Hmm. Of course. Well, it would seem, then, that we are all very lucky... Someone is cheered up. I think I shall retire. Eloise? Well, I, I shall be with you shortly. I, I must just prepare some warm chocolate for Valentine. Oh, that's, that's most considerate of you, my dear. But can't one of the servants... Mm. I know how much she likes it. But what do we perceive in her wide, happy smile, most honoured friends? Good night. What? Good night. Villainy. Good night. Andrea! Where are you, Andrea? I'm here, Catherine. Then help me down. Be careful, man. Did you get any diamonds? You said the house was empty. It is. Then what was Abby Bassoni doing there? Abby who? Well, let's just get going, shall we? Are you saying there was someone in there? Gone deaf. Have we? What did you say to him? Nothing. And why can't you look me in the eye? Can we please just get out of here? Lead the way. Thank you. Oh, by the way, Kadrus. What? I forgot to give you this. Help! Help, Mona! Stand back! Stand back! <laughs> That ruse. You're, you're not Abby Bassani. Who are you? I am the Count of Monte Cristo. And before that, you knew me as Dantes. <laughs> what? Edmund Dantes. The man you did nothing to save, despite knowing in every detail the mendacious plot to denounce him. Abby Bassani promised me that if I went home and left Paris tonight. <laughs> exactly. He said if I let you go in order to leave your miserable fate to God, and God chose for you to die, just as you chose to leave Dante's to his fate. You let me go. <laughs> Goodbye, Cat Rose. Valentine. It's time to stop reading now. Yes, stepmother. <laughs> Quite a day for us, all things considered. His father's still very angry. No. And you know, but I would very much like us to be friends, my dear. I should like that too. We should have no secrets from one another. None. <sighs> I'd like that very much, stepmother. Now. Drink this. Thank you. And don't worry, dear Valentine. I shall stay here at your side until you have finished every last drop. <laughs> In The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas, adapted by Sebastian Bonchkevich, The Count is played by Ian Glenn, Ede by Jane Lapotere, Gérard de Villefort by Paul Rees, Eloise de Villefort by Kate Fleetwood, General Noirtier by Carl Johnson, and Valentine by Lizzie Watts. Baron Dongla is Toby Jones, Hermine Dongla, Stephanie Racine, Eugenie, Eleanor Crooks, 
Fernand, Zubin Vala, and Mercedes, Josette Simon. Cadrus is played by Ben Crow, Andrea Cavalcanti by Will Howard, Bertuccio by Paul Stonehouse, Max Morel by Adam Nagaitis, and Jacopo by Joe Sims, with Robert Blythe and Sarah Tom. The music is by David Tobin and Jeff Megan, and the directors are Jeremy Mortimer and Sasha Yevtushenko. Tomorrow, in the final part of The Count of Monte Cristo, the full consequences of the Count's revenge shake Paris. John Wyndham's sci-fi classic The Kraken Wakes gets a modern retelling this weekend on BBC Radio 4 Extra, starring Tamsin Gregg and Paul Higgins as radio reporters. Nobody with any credibility wants to put their head above the parapet and say the aliens have landed. But I could write a script that's quite speculative. It would be the last script the science department ever commissioned from us. What are you two cooking up? Nothing. <laughs> All that fireball stuff has given the two of you a bit of a reputation. We've just had a tip from some conference, a paper about unexplained discoloration in the ocean currents. But we don't know where... We'll be delighted, Bill. The Croc and Wakes, adapted by Val McDermott. Plus Canadian horror in Nightfall. Join me, Dan Mersch, for The Seventh Dimension, BBC Radio 4 Extra's home of sci-fi, fantasy and horror, this Saturday and Sunday at 6pm and midnight. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Adapted by Sebastian Bonchkevich Part 4 The cool winds of September You have nearly achieved all you set out to accomplish, Dantes. Announce a long summer's end. Know that God smiles upon you. And with those winds... As do I. The culmination, most esteemed and honoured friends, of the cataclysm. I be for real. Of the Count of Monte Cristo. All the pieces are now in place, are they not? They are. The voice of his friend and long dead teacher. And soon, vengeance will be meted out upon Dongla and the Villefort. It will. But with vengeance comes responsibility, Dantes. Great responsibility. Valentine. Valentine. It's me, my love. Maximilian. While in a shadowed and somewhat overgrown corner of the De Villefort garden... Are you there? Answer me if you're there. A young man... Please. ...whispers disconsolately through the cracks of a paint-peeled wall. Knock twice on the wall if you can. Answer me. Why don't you answer me? Can you imagine the unimaginable torment I went through when I heard the news, my dear Count? And on a quiet street corner in that always fashionable suburb of Auteuil... Your unimaginable concern is much appreciated, Andrea. Spilled blood still stains the stone oh why one can still see the drops of oh. on the doorstep of the count's magnificent country house you didn't know him did you andrea uh, know him this cadrus from marseille <laughs> whatever are you implicating my dear Count? only he seemed to have a very accurate idea as to which room to break into it's almost as if he had a a plan drawn <laughs> you surely don't imagine that i would i Never imagine, Andrea, I ascertain. And this is this which sets you above all other men, dear Count. Did you betray me, Andrea? I, I, I did not know this man, Cadaquez. Cadrus. I did not know him, either. All proceeds well with the wedding preparations, I hope? Baron Donglar has it all in hand. And your bride-to-be? Two lovebirds could not be happier. Then it's love. Love is not nearly an appropriate enough word. I shall see you at the wedding tomorrow, Andrea. Until then, dear Count. I wondered if I might speak with you, Father. While across Paris, most honoured friends, hmm? there are only two topics of polite conversation. Um, can't wait for this evening, Eugenie. I'm actually very busy. 
With what? The first is the attempted robbery at the home of the now fabled Count of Monte Cristo. With what? She says. <laughs> With what? And the second is the forthcoming wedding between the Count's ward, Andrea Cavalcanti, and the daughter of one of the wealthiest men in Paris. We're organising this wedding, that's what. Yes, most honoured friends. Baron Danglars himself. And this wedding's financial benefits are what? What would you say, Father, in your expert opinion? I beg your pardon, Eugénie. After all, you are now in a position to speculate on the markets once again, are you not, Father? Is there a dress fitting or something you should be attending? With the sum of money promised you by the Count of Monte Cristo. Once my wedding to that reptile, Andrea, has been formalised, of course. You are not to speak of dear Monsieur Cavalcanti that way. I assume that you've seen the prison number dear Monsieur Cavalcanti has tattooed on his wrist. I think you should go to your room and we'll pretend this conversation never took place. Which is why I was... Eugénie! Curious. I was thinking somewhere in the region of three to four million francs. Uh, am I mistaken? Eugénie, please, uh, sit down. Certainly, Father. <laughs> All right. Now, I want you to listen to me, sweetheart. All I want, all we want is for you to be happily settled and comfortable. Good news, Baron uh, No, not now, Michelle. But you said I was to let you know the minute our stock valuation rose above a thousand points. No, Michelle. What I said was, not now. Thank you, Father. Most enlightening. Uh, Eugenie! You must think me very rude to impose upon your hospitality once again, Count. Not at all, Monsieur Morel. In fact, I was about to instruct my man, Jacopo, to send a message inviting you here. In regard to...? In regard to the fact that I'm making plans to leave Paris once I have settled certain outstanding issues. May we converse freely. The subject matter is somewhat delicate. Please. I have a slave. I'm sorry? In name alone. She is more a, a companion to me. And I consider her the absolute mistress of my house, Ede. Why, yes. Ede. She who addresses you. What of her? She whose task it is to describe to you, most honoured friends, the revelation. Forgive me my bluntness, but I can think of no man more suitable to court her than you, my dear Monsieur Morel. Of the Count of Monte Cristo. Court her? Obviously, a dowry needs to be negotiated. You do me too much honour, Count, but I must most politely decline your invitation. Well, I have distressed you, forgive me. No, sir, you have not. If I might also speak candidly. Please. I am already promised. May I ask to whom? To a young lady whose, whose qualities are way beyond my limited powers of description, but a person who is... Who is... There is water at your side. The reason for my visit today. You see, my dear Count, I have not heard a word from Valentine in over two weeks. Oh. This is most out of character. Even if there were some alteration in her feelings, for the truth is I fear that something terrible may have happened. Can you not approach her parents? Oh, her father is the Crown Prosecutor of Paris. A pleasure to see you again, my dear Count. The pleasure is all mine, I do assure you, Monsieur de Villefort. Inquiries are still ongoing, of course, into Cadrus and any nefarious accomplices he may have had in tow. But one might surmise that it was indeed an accomplice who murdered him. Well, if so, then the accomplice has saved the state some considerable expense. Two terms in Marseille, one in Toulon. This Cadrus is quite the villain. I'm confident that you and your department are doing all you can to find his murderer. Monsieur. And with that, the man who consigned poor Edmond Dantes to 14 years of unspeakable anguish in the infamous Chateau d'If, solely in order to secure his good name and reputation, nods his head respectfully. No, the reason for my visit today was to invite you and your dear wife to my house. As befits a renowned and much respected defender of public justice. Your house? Accompanied by your children, of course, Edouard, and your daughter, Valentine, is it? Yeah, that's, that's, that's most kind. Most kind. 
Unfortunately, though, my, my daughter is not in, in the best of health. Oh, I'm very sorry to hear that. Now, if there is nothing else, I would like Your to... Your neighbour, Abby Bussoni. What about him? I have always found him to be a source of great spiritual comfort, should you require a shoulder upon which to lean. Oh, I, I shall bear that in mind, Count. Thank you. Now, any progress we make will immediately be communicated to you. My thanks as always. Oh, there was just one more thing. Yes. My house at Otoy was previously owned by your first wife's parents, was it not, the Samurai? My late wife spent her childhood there. And they had a gardener, I believe, a fellow by the name of Petuccio. Did they? You didn't know him? No, no. Only there are some papers I found at the house which make some reference to payments due to him. You wouldn't know anything about that, would you? I have no recollection of the individual you refer to. Now, if there's nothing else... Well, good day to you, monsieur. Good day. But let us look a little closer and observe the tiniest tremor pulsing suddenly in the Crown Prosecutor's never very ruddy... Be sure to drink it all up, Valentine. ...cheek. Thank you, stepmother, but I think I've had enough. This elixir can only help you regain your strength. Then why do I still feel so sick? You must not distress yourself, my dear. The medicine will take a little while to work, won't it, Edouard? If you say so, Mama. I hope you came and said hello to your sister today, young man. Did you like the picture I drew, Valentine? Oh, I loved it, Edouard. Thank you. It's a train, and when you're better... We'll go on one together, won't we? You can depend upon it. You're not going to die, are you? Oh. Honestly, Edouard, the very idea you're to go to the nursery this instant. I shall see you tomorrow, sweetheart. Bye, Valentine. Bye-bye. You must try and get some rest, mm -hmm. child. And there is great news. There is. Mm, your grandfather has finalised the alterations to his will. Oh. You and Edouard are to inherit all the wealth of the Noirtier family. Imagine. Imagine. Last night, I dreamt my mother called to me from beyond. Dear God. And I was... I was too terrified to answer. Oh, come here, child. But what do we see twitching there on the never very full or particularly generous lips of Madame Eloise de Villefort? But will you not be late for the wedding feast? A smile, perhaps. Oh, you're much more important than some silly wedding at the Danglars. <coughs> now, I'm not going anywhere until I see you finish all your medicine. The smile of one who perceives her most mendacious scheme to be... I will finish it, I promise, but please go to the wedding. All but... As long as you see that you do. Accomplished. You will send my regards to Eugenie. <laughs> she was always so very fond of you, my dear. <laughs> and who knows? <laughs> Perhaps I shall discover you a prospective husband this evening. <laughs> now, rest. And remember, every last drop. <sighs> oh, Maximilian. Maximilian. He sends his fondest greetings to you, mademoiselle. Who, who are you? I am the Count of Monte Cristo. <gasps> and you must listen to me, Valentine. Listen to me very, very carefully. My compliments, dear Baron. My compliments to you, dear boy. Is the Count not with you? Uh, he's on his way, I believe. <laughs> the wedding of the year, they're calling it. <laughs> Imagine. All of Parisian society here, in my house. Amazing. For Andrea Cavalcanti, thief and murderer, plucked from the back streets of Marseille, by a mysterious man representing the person he has come to think of as his guardian angel. Why, yes, most honoured friends, the Count of Monte Cristo himself. And my angel? Oh, my 
Eugenie is with her maids of honor. For Andrea? Well, I'm sure she will enjoy that. These last few months have passed as if in a wonderful, wonderful dream. There you are, Baron. Oh, good evening, Monsieur Cavalcanti. Baroness? May I say that you are looking ravishing this evening. <laughs> ravishing. <laughs> I see you have, as ever, spared no expense. Oh, you are too uh, kind, madame. Too kind. Uh, now, I must steal my husband away for just one moment, if you don't mind. <laughs> what? I shall await with trepidation your most imminent return. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Keep smiling, Dongler, and look only at me as I tell you this. Your daughter has disappeared. I bet she and that piano teacher of hers. Millie? Yes, Millie. What's she got to do with anything? Oh, do wake up, Dongla. And your stepmother brings you this elixir every night. She says it will improve my health. It is poison. Poison? But why would my stepmother wish to harm me? Can you not think of a reason? No. There has been no change of circumstance. None that I... My grandfather altered his will. Altered it how? Dividing his fortune between me and my half-brother, Edouard. Then there it is. Count? I need you to trust me, Valentine. Do you think you can do that? No, I still don't understand how you managed to get into my bedroom. How I got in here is of no importance. What is important is that Maximilian Morel loves you and wants only to be with you forever. Is he well? Did you see him? No man has greater love for you than he. Oh, Maximilian is more than all the world to me, Count. I have devised a means by which you and Maximilian may be married. But first you must trust me. Do you trust me? And now, young Valentine de Villefort stares and stares very deeply into the heartfelt gaze of the Count of Monte Cristo, detecting in those bright blue eyes a soul of such love and exquisite sorrow. I do. The course is not without its perils. If it leads to Max and I being united forever, then... Take this. What is it? It is an opiate. An... It is quite benign, I do assure you, and will furnish you with the most diverting visions until you eventually wake up. Uh, and when will that be? Soon. Well, the servants have searched everywhere. There's no sign of her or Millie. Well, you Jane, you can't just have vanished, can she, I mean? Not only has she vanished, she's also cleared out all her savings and taken both the diamond necklaces we gave her. Both of them? She has disgraced us, Dongla. Our little girl disgraced us in front of everyone. While at that exact moment, a devilishly handsome young man dressed in the very finest style climbs aboard a railway carriage at Saint-Lazare, accompanied by his ravishingly beautiful young bride, who just as soon as the carriage door is shut securely behind her, turns eagerly to kiss him. Oh, Eugenie, are we really doing this? We are, Millie. We really are. <sighs> oh, do I not look splendid in this suit? Very handsome. <laughs> Tickles a touch, the moustache. But otherwise... Your parents will be... Oh, what parents? I have no parents, and from this day on, we shall live as artists, free to travel where our muse directs us, always together. I love you, Eugenie. I love you too, Millie. And still, there is no sign of the Count. Perhaps something has happened. Without a bride, there can be no wedding, Dongla. Count or no Count. Is everything all right, Baron? Uh, everything's under control, Andrea. Quite under control. Madame le Monsieur, the Count of Monte Cristo. About bloody time, too. Well, don't just stand there, husband. Go and greet him. My dear Count. Baron Dongla. Is something wrong? I'm afraid so, yes. Is it Eugenie? Eugenie? She has disappeared, you see. That may be for the best. For the... I don't understand. Officers! What is the meaning of this? These officers are here to arrest a felon. With guns? If need be. At a wedding? There will be no wedding today. No we... What? 
And immediately the Count opens a small valise and drops a blood-stained waistcoat onto that polished ballroom floor. This is the waistcoat of the murdered thief Cadruz. And this is a note he had secreted in a pocket. A note? Written in his own hand. As you can see, Baron Dongla, it is addressed to you. To me? Read. Yeah. Baron. What does it say? Sir, the man you know as Andrea Cavalcanti and your daughter's intended husband is a convict. <laughs> and, uh... And thief. There must be some mistake. Well, I have been as deceived by him as all of you. R read on. He escaped with me from the prison at Toulon. He was known in Marseille as Benedetto Benedetti. But he doesn't know his real name as he never knew his parents. He is a villain. Cadrus. Have you something to say? Andrea Cavalcanti. You bloody set me up, didn't you, Monte Cristo? Officer, seize that man! This is a set-up! A bloody set-up! Cavalcanti, a, a murderer? How can this be happening? Well, it would seem as if your discovery of that incriminating note was most timely, Count. Some wine? Uh, nothing, thank you. Indeed, Monsieur de Villefort. And now the villain Benedetto Benedetti can be tried for the murder of Cadrus and justice, French justice, can be seen to be done at last. Santé. God's justice too. Hmm. I assume I shall see you at the trial. You may depend upon it. Come. Sir. What is it, Leon? You're required at home urgently, sir. Your daughter... Has... Um, has something happened to Valentine? It might be best if you... Oh, for goodness sake, man. She's dead, sir. If... You will be so good as to excuse me, Count. My sincere condolences. The thief and murderer we know as Andrea Cavalcanti... Is that you, Benedetto Benedetti? ...sits on a scrap of dirty hay in a dungeon below the courthouse. Who wants to know? Our time together is short, so listen. You again. But have we not met this man before, most honoured friends? You get away from me, you hear? Have we not seen him chase this same Benedetto? Down a dirty alleyway in Marseille. Stop play acting and get your sorry ass back where I can see you. Who are you to give me orders? I'm here on behalf of your guardian angel. <laughs> Take it up by guardian angel, you'll be my good friend and benefactor, the Count of Monte Cristo. The man I have to thank for dumping me in this shitty cell. A fine guardian angel, he takes. <laughs> Do I have your full attention? What do you want? To change your life. This is a trick. This is another of his tricks. <laughs> you listening? Yes. Yes, I'm listening. Good. Then I'll begin. Forgive me, Abbe Bersoni, for coming here at this late hour. My door is always open to you, Monsieur de Villefort. Why, yes, most honoured friends. Do we not recognize in the grizzled face and twinkling eye of Abbe Busoni the features... My daughter is... Uh... ...of another? I know. Your servant told me, and I am desolated by your loss. Valentine, my daughter, has been ill for some time. Ill with what? Well, nobody could say. But the symptoms came upon her very suddenly. Then you were not prepared for her decline. It's as if she was struck down. In my limited experience, a young person is very rarely struck down inexplicably. What? 
Perhaps you would permit me to examine your late daughter's room. Examine her room? I was presumptuous, forgive me. No, if, if, if you think it would do some good. I think it might put your mind at ease to know what it was that so afflicted her. If you would please follow me. Where are you going, father? Through this wall, apparently. A secret door. Shall we? I'm sorry. Monsieur... Jacobo. Monsieur Jacopo, uh, I'm not sure I quite understand you. Perhaps I didn't say it plainly enough. The Count of Monte Cristo wishes to withdraw his credit of six million francs from the Bank of Dongla. Effective immediately. Well, that's impossible. It's quite impossible. I may as well be writing my own note of bankruptcy. Without wishing to be in any way indelicate, Baron... Another scandal, financial or otherwise, would, I'm sure, be most unwelcome. I assume begging will do me no good? None whatsoever. Nothing has been disturbed? And... To the best of my knowledge, no. Uh, now whose is this cup on the floor, Monsieur de Villefort? It's my daughter's. Well, that's odd. Odd? This solution here. Well, my wife was preparing medicine for her. Is your wife skilled in preparing medicines? She, she has a small parlor that she goes to. I see. Perhaps you would be good enough to show me this room of hers. Only if you would be good enough to share your suspicions with me, Abby. At first glance, the solution contained within this cup suggests that it is more of a poison than a medicine. Uh, yeah. You're jesting. Benedetto, Benedetti. No, sir. I assure you, I am not now the room. Oh, a very good morning to you, Jailer. Is it? Yeah. Oh, bread and water. How very fitting. Fitting for what? Well, for a communion, of course. Oh, it's nothing short of a miracle. Dirty water into wine. <laughs> what? You ought to be coming to take you to trial in half an hour. And you'll hang, boy. Hang. And I shall await them with keen anticipation. Good morning, Eloise. Oh, Charlotte! <laughs> what on earth are you doing, sitting in the dark? Quite the laboratory you have in here. <laughs> Sorry? Did you truly believe that you could systematically poison my daughter and that I would not find out? Have you taken leave of your senses? This cup? Yes. This is Valentine's cup, is it not? I don't think I want to continue this conversation. You will stay exactly where you are. Now, I have had this cup's contents examined by one skilled in chemistry. <laughs> Or might I inquire as to who this gentleman may be? You may not, no. Now you can continue to oppose this ridiculous charade, or you can save us both a lot of time and trouble and tell me the truth. Because, one way or another, I will have... Oh, Cheryl, please! I assume it was all about Edouard inheriting my father's money, was it not? Edouard is our boy, Gerard, our wonderful boy! Armed men wait outside and guard the gates. Armed. And they will ensure that you remain here under house arrest. I want to see a lawyer. I demand a lawyer. Tonight, as soon as I return from the courts, I will have you clapped in irons and tried for Valentine's murder. You may have your lawyer then. Oh, don't do this, Gerald. My only regret is that the law forbids me trying you myself. But rest assured, Eloise... You will be executed before even half the autumn leaves have fallen from the trees. No, this is all a terrible, terrible mistake. Until this evening. Madame. Oh, Count. Charles! Baroness Dongler. 
A pleasure, as always. All of Paris, it seems, struggles to gain admittance to what the daily newspapers describe as the trial of the decade. I assume you have not seen my husband? I? No. You seem distressed, madame. As you might be, Count, if you awoke, as I did this morning, to find yourself husbandless, daughterless, and penniless. The trial of the villain Benedetto Benedetti, known in all the fashionable salon across the capital as one Andrea Cavalcanti. Penniless? Dongla has ransacked my personal accounts, stolen all my jewellery, even taken my wedding ring. And now he leaves me to face the dishonour of his bankruptcy and this trial alone. There are even death threats. You have my sympathies, madame, but I still do not understand how such Because a... your dear friend Baron Dongla is a spineless, greedy little criminal with the conscience of a reservoir rat. Ah. 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 Is that your last word on the matter? I do not know what else you would have me say. I would have you reach out to me. Order! Order! And now, Andrea Cavalcanti is led into the dock. Perhaps we should continue this conversation after the trial. His face, a radiant sun of smiles, as he waves to all his former friends, who are eagerly gathered to witness what surely has to be the final act of his disgrace and ruin. Will the prisoner please identify himself? Oh, the prisoner would be only too pleased to do so if the prisoner had the first idea as to who he actually was. <laughs> Excuse me. In fact, I was hoping you might be able to give me some pointers in that regard, Monsieur de Villefort. Young man, if you do not wish to be held in contempt of this court, I would advise you to attend to these murder proceedings with the seriousness they deserve. Ooh la la. Get him. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Oh, you will do, that's for sure. Now, in order that we finally sort out this name business once and for all, I call one Monsieur Bertuccio to the stand. Marseille. Yes, Monsieur Morel, Marseille. The Count asks only that you trust him. My Valentine is dead. The Count and I have no further business. And the Count mourns your loss, but requests that you join him in a month from now. October 5th, in fact. May I ask who it is that I am speaking to? My name is Ade. Am I not lovely, most honoured friends? The Count's companion. His most devoted friend and servant. Yeah, he said you were his slave. It is important that you do as the Count politely requests. He suggested you rendezvous with him outside your father's old office. The Count was confident you would remember exactly where that was. And the purpose of this rendezvous? Please state your name for the court, please. Must wait until then. My name is Bertuccio. And who do you work for, Bertuccio? And now at last, most honoured friends, we have a name for the man we last saw with Andrea in his prison cell. I work for the Count of Monte Cristo. And before that? Before that, I worked as a gardener for the Samaran in Otoy. And the Samaran were? The parents of Crown Prosecutor Gerard de Villefort's first wife, Renée. Thank you. Now, may I take you back 20 years to the night of August the 3rd, 1820? What has any of this to do with the charges the defendant currently faces? Begging the court's indulgence, I only ask for patience, and all will become clear. Well, I sincerely hope so, for your sake, young man. Then, may I proceed? You may, but be advised. I insist that you respect the formalities of this court. Now, proceed. But what do we see in the eyes of Gérard de Villefort? Monsieur Bertuccio. As he looks upon the gardener, Bertuccio. What can you tell me about that night? A man he hoped never to see again. I can remember that a baby was born that night. Why, yes, most honoured friends. A baby that his father tried to bury beneath a tree. Fear. <gasps> Baroness? That man there, Count. That Bertuccio. He says he works for you. That is correct. In what capacity? As my servant. But what has he to do with Andrea? What indeed? And now the Count's eyes shine. With what? With victory. As Bertuccio. And what did you do for that baby, Bertuccio? 
tells everything. I dug him up and saved him. Sent him to live with my sister, Danielle. And the father of the child? When he saw what I had done, he gave me money to give to my sister for its upkeep. And was there a condition? There was. That I never divulge the baby's true identity to anyone. And is the father of that unfortunate infant present in this court today? He is, sir. I'll point him out, please. Brett, this past has gone on for long enough. It is Monsieur de Villefort himself. It is Monsieur de Villefort that attempted to bury a baby alive, sir. The court is adjourned. They said the court is adjourned! But the mob pays no attention to him who was once the most feared of all Crown prosecutors as he numbly raises his gavel up and down like a now stringless... And is that unfortunate child present in this courtroom today? Worthless. Did you not hear me? Marionette. The bastard child is here, sir. <gasps> as is his mother. Be good enough to identify the mother. She sits beside the Count of Monte Cristo. Ermine Dongla! Oh, no! 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 <coughs> no! <coughs> <coughs> Clear the court! Now, be good enough to identify that bastard son. Why, he is you yourself, sir. You are the child of Hermine Dondar and Gerard de Villefort. Are you suggesting to this court that yesterday this woman all but married her illegitimate son to her legitimate daughter? I am, sir. We need not dwell on facts. We already know. There will be order. I said order! Please! The mysterious disappearance of Andrea Cavalcanti. Well, that all went exactly to your plan, didn't it, Batuccio? Very nice and smooth. I like smooth. Wait. The V force face when he heard our news. <laughs> Priceless. Is this about the Count's furnace for my escape? You have much to answer for, Andrea. Excuse me? Ow! Take your hands from off me! Ow! Now, I want you to be in no doubt, Benedetto. This is not revenge for that scumbag cat. Who are you? This is for sending my sister to an early grave. She, who never gave you anything but a mother's love. My poor Tanya. What are you doing? Untie my hands, please! No. No, I'll be... <laughs> No need we dwell upon the scandal now heaped upon the disgraced house of Donglau. <laughs> but where, you ask, is the Count? Why, he is now a shadow among shadows in that always somewhat gloomy house on the Champs-Elysees. Who's that there? Witnessing at first hand... Abibassoni. The cataclysm he has engineered. Does one only ever find you in the presence of death? I came to say a prayer for Valentine. Well, then pray for me, too. Pray for us all. Pray for? Where are the servants? Gone. Fled. You were alone? Apparently so. I heard about today's events. The court. If there's anything you want... Do you like chocolates, Abby? Edouard. Like chocolate, shall I see if I can find you one? Thank you, but that is not the reason for my... Ah, oh, you're here to say prayers for my daughter, yeah? And to tell you that your debt to me is now paid in full. My debt to you? To Edmund Dantes. To... A falsely Ed... denounced sailor you consigned to 14 years of hell in the Chateau d'If. What on earth are you doing? Showing you who I am. Count. What is... Explain yourself, sir. My name is Edmond Dantes. Edmond? The man whose life you destroyed with no more thought than you'd give to swatting dead a fly. Dantes. Dantes. The, 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 the sailor with the letter. The letter addressed to your father, the Bonapartist General Noitier. The letter which, had it reached its destination, would have finished your career forever. The letter you burned as you burned me with your false reassurances. But that was 25 years ago. 
yesterday. And you have waited all this time to... I have waited to destroy you as you destroyed me utterly and completely. Then you have accomplished all you set out to do, Dauntes. And more. So much more. More? Come into my son's nursery, please. What? Surely you don't hesitate. Well, has something... The door, sir. Oh, no. No. I trust that you're pleased with your handiwork. I, no, I had no handiwork. But you, you gave my wife detailed instructions in the preparations of poisons, did you not? Doubtless, that was part of your revenge, was it not? But I did not envisage... That she would poison Edouard and then take her own life? No. <laughs> Quite a picture, isn't it? Mother and son, clasped tenderly together. You see, I did exactly as you told me, Count. I confronted Eloise. I told her she would hang for murdering Valentine. And look, she has saved us both the trouble. There may be something I can do for the boy. Does it keep away from my son? My son? son. God forgive me. Now, if there is no further business between us, I'd like some time alone with... With my family. <laughs> my family. <laughs> I really haven't the time today. Thank you, Monsieur Jacopo. I am here on the Count's business, Baroness Dongler. I no longer recognise that name. And I think the Count has done me enough harm for one lifetime, don't you? He instructed me to give you this. No, thank you. It's a first-class ticket to America. This... The Count exiling me to America? He does not consider it so. There is this, too. A bag of diamonds? And rubies. And <gasps> emeralds. Please. Take the ticket, madame. With the Count's compliments. Is it? Oh, don't go to her, boy. Stay here with me. Medicine, medicine. Like Valentine's. Oh, get away from her. Don't interfere, don't it? She will kill the boy. Happy for if She will kill the boy if he drinks. Take the cup in your hands, Edouard. I said there would be responsibilities. Drink. Did I not? It tastes funny, Mama. Oh, no. No, Edouard. No. Oh. Master. Master. We have to save the boy, Eddie. We have to save. You were screaming in your sleep. No. And you came to me. As I will always come to you. Always. No, from this moment on, you have no further obligation to me, dear Ede. I release you. And if I do not wish to be released? Not wish to be. I earn only for your comfort, Master. But I am so old, so beyond redemption. Then you do not love me. Say so and I will leave. Oh, Ede, Ede, I have done, I have done the most terrible thing. You are too harsh. People will speak in awe of what you have accomplished, my Master. <sighs> What news of de Villefort? He is insane. I want him well looked after. The finest doctors... Have already been found. Then only Dongla remains. <laughs> and remember what we said about clothes last time? Mm. You first, Signor Franco. Dongla has been observed. Rome is unseasonably warm for October. Just you wait till I get my hands on you, you... 
<laughs> now then, Sylvia, look what Daddy's brought, huh? Oh. Good evening, Signor Franco. Count. I had forgotten the many distractions a disgraced banker in disguise can find in Rome. Thank you, Sylvia. A job well done. Count? You know her? Uh, please send Jacopo and Petruccio up as you leave. Immediately. Jacopo and... Take a seat. Uh, at least let me put some clothes on. I said sit. You were always a crafty one, Donglan. Even in Marseille. Marseille? What are you talking about, Marseille? Ask anyone who served on the Ferron. They'll tell you. You were on the Ferron? I never understood what it was old Monsieur Morel saw in you. Can't have been the honest face, can it, Donglan? Who are you? Why, I am the man who has destroyed you, as you destroyed me. You are... You're, you're, you're the Count of Monte Cristo. You... You cannot be destroyed. But before that, I was just a man. Barely a boy, in fact. A boy you betrayed. A boy I... What are you talking I about? I am talking about the first mate of the Pharaoh. Dantes. Edmund Dantes. At your service. It was Fernand. Fernand who denounced you, not me. I liked you. I... Always did. Liked me enough to have me arrested and thrown into the bowels of the Chateau d'If just so no. that you could take my position no. as captain. No, 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 no. You Fourteen no years, Dongla. Fourteen years without warmth or food or daylight. Oh. Fourteen years of degradation and heartbreak. And for what? Dear God, man, have mercy. Have mercy. Come. What? You sent for his count. Permit me to introduce my long-time associates and friends, <laughs> Monsieur Batuccio and Jacopo, who, oh. of course, you know. Not much of a man without his britches, is he, Maltese? What? What, what, what do you want? Uh, why, that which is most precious to you, your money. I... I... I have no money. You left Paris with over a million francs in cash and jewels. Now, where is it? Please, do not make me ask you again. Buried. Buried where? Don't do this, please. Did you not hear my friend's question? Buried where? Just let me get some clothes on and we can you go... You to... shall go as you are. A traveller, straying aimlessly across an old, all but forgotten orchard on the outskirts of Rome tonight, would witness a most unusual spectacle. Dig, Dongla. <laughs> Even for Rome. I'll be sure you don't waste that time. Oh, it's here. It's here. A man, nondescript, but for his nakedness, oh, no, it's here. digging. Desperately digging as the sun rises slowly over these gnarled and ancient trees. It's all there. This is a saddlebag. All of it. Want me to check, Maltese? I shall take Baron Dongla at his word. The horses, Petuccio. I suppose you're going to kill me now. Fortunately for you, I've resolved never to kill again. Give him a sheet. <clears throat> we shall not meet again. <clears throat> oh. Oh. Yeah! And as the Count and his companions ride away into the sunrise, the man we know as Baron Dongla sinks to his knees and crawls toward an all but forgotten well, where he pauses before he drinks, wondering as to what it is that is different about the face he sees rippling there. Thank Dongla. Think. And then, with the first fingers of dawn, he realizes My that his once <laughs> dense head of black, black hair has turned completely white overnight. Madame de Morsa, is it you? Count? 
Forgive me, I did not expect to meet. What brings you to Marseille? To say a final goodbye. I leave France tomorrow. For where? The open sea. With no destination. Do you walk here every day? Is that a question, or is it that you already know? It is most fortunate that we meet today, madame. Is it? As I have something here. The glass rose. Thank you for returning it to me. I thought it only right to return it to him who first gave it to me. I am sure that he would be happier if you were to accept it back. The man who gave me that once precious rose is long dead. And forgotten? Him I will never forget. Does this gentleman have a name? Yes. Edmund, he does. You are mistaken, madame. I am the Count of Monte Cristo. And has the Count of Monte Cristo achieved all he set to achieve? He has. Then what punishment can I expect to enjoy? Punishment? That is what you do, is it not? Meet out punishment? And I am easily the guiltiest. You are guilty of nothing. Oh. I waited for you, Edmund. I stood here, on this very dock, waiting, praying, to see you come whistling around that corner. For over two years, I petitioned Prosecutor de Villevaux for some news of your fate, but there was never any reply. And in the end, in the end, I had to accept that my darling Edmund was gone, and gone for good. Oh, please, Miss. I never loved him, Fernand. God forgive me, but I never did. But he was so, so insistent. We need not speak. So of persistent to have what he wanted. Then suddenly you are in Paris. And I see at once the suffering that time has scrawled upon that once beautiful face of yours. And I want only to go to you, to kiss you, hold you. But you are changed. So very changed. Don't, Miss I feel an emotion I never thought your presence could provoke in me. That is dread, Edmund. Pure and unadulterated. I suffered much as a consequence of your husband's betrayal. Then we are at least companions in that. What shall we do with the rose, Mercedes? Let us give it to the sea. If that is what you want. I want only to live in peace. Shall we? Where will you go now? There is a convent in the mountains. The sisters have kindly offered to accept me. Oh, oh be glad. I have found some tranquility there. Then you have been blessed. Go well, Edmund. My one, my only love. Pray for me. And now the Count sits at that quayside. <laughs> And as the hours pass, and the sun rises inexorably towards its zenith... Count? Monsieur Morel. I was told to meet you at my father's offices, October the 5th. Indeed you were. My yacht awaits. Forgive me, monsieur, but I have had enough of this trailing after It'll you. It'll be worth your while, sir. I do assure you. For three hours, most honoured friends, we sail southwest out of Marseille, past the stark white walls of the Chateau d'If, and out toward the line of the furthest horizon. Land ahoy! 
And at the helm... Drop anchor on my signal, Jacopo! The Count. Right you are, Montes! Now! <laughs> Maximilian! Where are we? The Isle of Monte Cristo. Monte Cristo? My servants will see you are well looked after. And you? I and the rest of my crew will be sailing on. There is, of course, a boat moored to take you safely back to France. But what am I doing here? For that, you must disembark. Maximilian! Valentine! Maximilian! Go to her! But how can this be? Go to her! They said you were dead. Everybody said you were dead. Oh. And who is that waving at us? Why, that is my grandfather. But General Noirtier is here. He is, and will live with us until the end of his days. Is that not wonderful news? Oh. And now that we have at last understood the wrath and revelation of the Count... It is all wonderful. All of it. You may ask me, most honoured friends, if you will ever be blessed enough to encounter the Count again. And I, Ede, the lovely daughter of the Sultan Ali Pasha, loyal and loving companion to the Count of Monte Cristo, can only say that you must wait, my friends. Set course south by southwest. Aye, aye, Maltese. Wait. Do we not have a good wind for a sail? Do, Maltese. We do. And hope. In The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas, adapted by Sebastian Bonchkevich, The Count is played by Ian Glenn, A Day by Jean Lapotere. The Younger A Day by Amber Rose Reva and Abbe Faria by Richard Johnson. Baron Dongla is Toby Jones. Hermine Dongla, Stephanie Racine. Eugenie, Eleanor Crooks. And Mercedes, Josette Simon. Gérard de Villefort is played by Paul Rees. Eloise de Villefort by Kate Fleetwood. Valentine by Lizzie Watts. And Edouard by Finn Monteith. Max Morel is Adam Nagaitis. Andrea Cavalcanti, Will Howard. Bertuccio, Paul Stonehouse. Jacopo, Joe Sims. And Millie, Sarah Tom. The music is by David Tobin and Jeff Megan. And the directors are Jeremy Mortimer and Sasha Yevdushenko. In tomorrow's drama, we meet Jean. She's 38, attractive and married. She decides to go on a cruise without her husband. On the first night out, she sees a row of lights sticking straight out to sea. She feels as if she's entering a strange land with different customs, different values. As if she's becoming a different person. Crossing the Frontier by the great Peter Tinniswood is tomorrow at the same time. Desert Island Discs Revisited on BBC Radio 4 Extra. Mario Testino. Your family was obviously well healed. I mean, middle class. Middle class. Not They weren't rich, but they adored their kids and they all... They wanted us to leave us if we were rich. We weren't rich because I had all my friends at school that were a lot richer than we were. But my father was generous and gave us more, you know. And you were indulged. You were looked after. Yeah, the, I was spoiled. I think financed, that because yeah. they saw I was different, and my parents were extra generous to me. I mean, but but go back much earlier than that to when you were a little boy, because as I read about you, you were really quite quiet, rather serious, obviously very bright at school. Uh, yeah, I was quite bright. They used to say I was near genius at maths because I was the only one that could could do it. So I only had to do maths for half of the year because I went too fast for the rest of the class. I was quiet, but not 
I wasn't shy, but I read, I, I read that you wanted to be a priest. At yes, one point. at one point I wanted, but you know we have a very strong Catholic upbringing. I mean, I don't think that I would consider myself a hundred percent like I used to be because too many things have happened, and so I've lived my life according to my, you know. But it stays with you that traditional upbringing. Life is about give and take. What you give is what you get. You know, it just comes back, and I try to apply that to my life. Try not to harm people. Try to help people. In a funny way, I think it comes back. Without you even trying, it's um, there for you. Desert Island Discs Revisited on Sundays at a quarter past ten in the morning and again in the evening at a quarter past nine on BBC Radio 4 Extra.